It is 3.06 and today is January 31st, 2023 and this is the Minnesota Senate Elections Committee and I'm calling you to order. We have uh, uh, a big bill today so we're going to be try to move as quickly as we can. Uh, the first bill is, uh, I'm sorry, I needed to say that we have a quorum so uh, votes count. And we have uh, two bills on the agenda, Senate File 538 with Senator Hoffman. Senator Hoffman, will you please begin? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Chair Carlson and members, Senate File 538. Uh, it's a great number, 538. And uh, if you do the history on it, you'll know why that it's a great number. It's an important bill, one that I have long supported and is long overdue in our state. Uh, back in 2013-14, it would have been Senator Ann Rest and then legislative uh, um, house author was a guy named Steve Simon. But I support the national popular vote because I believe the president should be elected in a system where three things, every vote is equal, every vote matters in every state, in every election, and the candidate with the most votes goes to the White House. I believe a voter in Minnesota should matter exactly as much as every other voter in a county, in a country, no matter where they live, whether it be Miami, Anchorage, or Hope, Arkansas. The Constitution is very clear that states control the Electoral College. Anyone who needs a reminder can look at Nebraska and Maine where state law awards electors based on the outcome in each congressional district. Twice in our lifetime, the second place candidate has gone to the White House. In our history, the second place candidate has won five times. Five out of 46 presidents really uh, is a difficult track record. Electing the second place candidate erodes faith in our elections and it really sends a wrong message at a time when our democracy, Mr. Chair and members, is sort of under attack. And further, in every presidential election, we see an intense focus on what is the so-called battle states. While 70 to 80 percent of the country is left on the sidelines and is taken for granted. In those battle states, you could see there's a, just a hand few of them. In our country, there are over 500,000 elected officials and only one can take office without getting more votes than their opponent. Only one can take office while regularly ignoring 70% of their voters. But states, uh, Mr. Chair, have the power to make this change and I hope Minnesota will join the 15 states in the District of Columbia that have already passed this bill. And these states, have 195 electoral votes of the 270 required for the proposal to take effect. It is, pa it is passed one chamber and another in a nine additional states with 88 electoral votes, more than the 75 required to deliver a national popular vote for president. Enacting national popular vote will remove the current incentive of candidates to focus on states which lean strongly in one political direction or another. When I say, Mr. Chair, is let's remove this unfair focus on battleground states and ensure that every voice across the nation is equally important in our elections. Over the years, I've heard from voters and colleagues from all parties that we need to extend the principle of one person, one vote to presidential elections. I am proud to back the bipartisan reform that would be good for the country. It's a common sense provision which is supported by the majority of Minnesotans. The National Popular Vote Compact offers a fundamentally fair system that ensures that is the will of the voters will prevail. And passing that gives us a chance to do our part to strengthen our democratic process. It restores faith in our elections and it advances equality and moves the country to a popular vote for president. Joining me today, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair and members, are several people who also support the national vote. Some are regular citizens who want to see their vote count, and some are experts on the history and details of how this law works. Um, I will give special mention to our Secretary of State, Steve Simon, um, right now. Steve Simon, in, in 2007, as a member of the House, I had mentioned earlier, he was the first person to introduce the National Popular Vote Bill. Uh, this bill has been around for a long time, and I hope Mr. Chair and members at 2023 is the year we send it to our governor. Uh, and with that, I want to introduce Secretary of State Steve Simon. Welcome, Secretary of State Simon. I think everyone knows you, but you should uh, state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and Member Steve Simon, Minnesota Secretary of State. It's an honor to be with you all here today. Um, I'm proud to support this bill and to have supported it since the time, as you heard, that I myself was the chief author in the Minnesota House. It comes down to me uh, to one central principle, and that is that in the world's greatest democracy, the second place vote getter should never be President of the United States. Let's just get this out of, out of the way right away. This has nothing, nothing whatsoever to do with Donald Trump's victory in 2016. As you heard, this is a movement that's been going on a long time before that. And President Trump, it bears repeating, won the 2016 election fair and square. He won it legitimately. He won it outright. He won it according to the rules. And there's some strong evidence that had the rules been different, he still would have won. He would have won the popular vote, arguably, if those would have been the rules in place at the time in 2016. My own interest in this issue stems not from that election, not even from Bush versus Gore in 2000, which was a similar instance of the second place vote getter becoming president of the United States, but before that in 1992. In 1992, this is my personal story that uh, is relevant to, to this legislation. 1992, I deferred school for a year and I moved to Little Rock, Arkansas to join the Bill Clinton for President campaign. It wasn't Clinton-Gore yet. It was June of 1992. Gore wasn't selected until a month later. It was the Clinton campaign. Bill Clinton had sewn up the nomination when I arrived in the first week in June, but he wasn't formally the nominee yet. And I remember the week that I arrived in Little Rock, Arkansas, a national poll came out. It showed that the first place person in the poll was uh, billionaire independent candidate Ross Perot. Remember him? The second place candidate at that time in the first week of June in 1992 was the incumbent president, George H.W. Bush. And third place was the candidate I was supporting, governor of Arkansas, Bill Clinton. And I remember hanging out during that first week or thereabouts in a restaurant that was kind of a hangout among campaign workers in downtown Little Rock called Your Mama's Restaurant. That was the actual name, Your Mama's Restaurant. And it served just the kind of food you think it would based on that name. And we were hanging out there, and the subject of the poll came up. And there were several of my colleagues on the campaign who thought nothing of the poll. In fact, they said, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all, because in a three-way race, even if our guy, Bill Clinton, is in third place, we can still win. Because as all of you know from your civics lessons, if no one gets to 270, what happens? It goes to the US House. And at that time, the US House was firmly in control of the Democratic Party. So their view was, who cares if Bill Clinton is in third place? And I myself, and not just me, but many others, were appalled, absolutely appalled by that attitude. I signed up to help get this guy elected president, but that's no way to win. The winner of the presidency of the United States should always be the person who most Americans have chosen as president of the United States, regardless of party, regardless of circumstance. And this bill would do that. It's not only common sense, it is widely bipartisan across the country. This bill, as Senator Hoffman said, would use the Electoral College, not get rid of it, keep the Electoral College, but use it so that the top vote getter will always be the, presidency, the President of the United States. So basically, states would award their electoral votes to the winners of the national popular vote. And as Senator Hoffman said, the Constitution is crystal clear about this, crystal clear. There is no argument that the framers wanted it this way or the founders wanted it that way, not true. They could have said something about that, and they did not. Instead, they were very explicit, very crystal clear explicit in the Constitution. The Electoral College is basically a point system. It goes by a fancy name, Electoral College, but it's just a point system. If you have more population, you get more points. Lower population, you get fewer points. It's a point system, and the Constitution is very clear. States, you get to award your points any way you want, any way you want. It just so happens that 48 states have chosen, and it is a choice. It is not in the Constitution. It is a choice that Minnesota and 47 others have said, if you win our state by one vote, you get everything. You get all 10 electoral votes. Two states, as Senator Hoffman said, Nebraska and Maine do it a different way. But the point is, we could do it any way we wanted if we wanted. So if you, in your wisdom, wanted to award Minnesota's 10 electoral votes to the tallest candidate, you could do that. If you wanted to avoid Minnesota's 10 electoral votes to the candidate with the most letters in their last name, you could do that constitutionally because the Constitution says that you get to award Minnesota's points, their electoral votes, any way you want. So this bill would basically say that the way that we want to do it is to award it to the winner of the national popular vote. And um, 
and 15 states, as you heard, have already done that. The side benefit, as Senator Hoffman ably said, is that we would have true national campaigns. Candidates would have every incentive to campaign everywhere, not just blue candidates in blue states, red candidates in red states, or both red and blue candidates in purple states. You would see Democrats going to Republican states. You'd see Republicans going to Democratic states, and I think that's a healthy thing. But fundamentally, Think of one way that it's helpful, at least to me, to think about it is, if you were starting from scratch, if any of us were starting from scratch in Minnesota, would we ever design a system like that in Minnesota? Would we ever say that counties are kind of like states? So if you win Hennepin County by one vote, you're, you're halfway there. That's 25% of the state's population. If you win Hennepin County by one vote, that's it. You get a, a half of the votes you need to win a statewide office. Throw in Ramsey and maybe Dakota, and you're probably pretty much there. Washington, you're almost certainly there and on and on and on. We would never design a system like that, as Senator Hoffman said, um, where you have chunks of geography that get points, and if you win that place by one point, you get it all. We just would never do that. We would never think of doing that. We would never make that choice. So it all comes back to fundamental fairness in my book, which is how can we, as the United States of America, say to a child, say, in Iraq or Afghanistan or Germany or Australia or Canada, that we believe so fundamentally in democracy, but we tolerate a system where, not so rarely anymore, the second place winner, the second place vote getter can and does now become not only president of the United States, but the most powerful person on planet Earth. It is untenable. It is simply unacceptable going forward, regardless of what has happened in previous elections. This is a bipartisan, common sense solution which maintains the architecture of the Electoral College. States still get to award points, but they do so based on our common interest, what unites us, which is who most Americans have chosen. And that's why for so long I have supported and will continue to support this bill. Thanks for your time and attention. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Secretary. Uh, uh, Senator Hoffman. You have more comments? Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't. I uh, thank the Secretary of State, Simon, for being here. And, and I see Ann Rest uh, is, where did Ann, there she is. You and, you and Secretary Simon, then when he was a legislator, um, brought this to the attention of the state. But you have a list of, of testifiers. I think Patrick Rosensteel is here, Sarah Bertschinger, Sean Parnell, uh, Todd Otis, Anit Me Annette Meeks. I mean, there's a whole list here, uh, Mr. Chair, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll set aside I think you guys have a yes. list of a whole, like, 16 people. Senator testifying. Hoffman, we do have the list, and I need to, need to remind people that we're going to move to, we have a lot of people that are signed up, and we're going to move to that tes testimony. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to give each person three minutes, please, to, uh, and we, we do have a timer here, so we will interrupt if you go over time. So three minutes a person, and please introduce yourself as you come up and begin speaking. And... Uh, and then just uh, finish your sentence if you're interrupted, but try to keep within that three minutes. Again, we have a lot of people that want to speak. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, I'll just let, so you can have all three seats up, I'll just go in back and wait. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Hoffman. Mr. Senator Cran. Mr. Chair, just a procedural question. So you're going to do all testimony and then do Q&A after for members? Yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Senator Cran. So, uh, our first person that's on the list is uh, Pat Patrick Rosensteel. The next person is Sarah Birchsinger. So if you want to get uh, on deck here, that would be really helpful. Uh, thank Mr. you, Mr. Rosen. Chairman. Uh, members of the committee, my name is Patrick Rosensteel. I am a Minnesotan, and I happen to be senior consultant to National Popular Vote. Uh, I've been working on this issue uh, since 2007, and I've uh, been in front of these chambers before, and I see a lot of friendly faces, some with us, some not. Um, but um, uh, the truth is, is I bring a conservative voice to reform here. I'm a, a, I'm a, if we registered in the state of Minnesota, I'd be a registered Republican. Uh, I've been a conservative uh, political consultant for my lifetime, and I've, um, you know, retired from that game. But um, uh, you know, served Republican presidents in their domestic policy agendas, and I'm a, I'm a full-throated proponent for the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Uh, and the reason I am is because I don't believe one person, one vote is a Democrat idea or a Republican idea. I think it's a foundational idea to the American Republic. 
Uh, I think the current system does nothing other than lead to hair-splitting lawsuits and courts choosing presidents in battleground states and not voters. Uh, I'll tell you the other reason I'm for reform is because I'm not afraid of my ideas and I'm not afraid of the voters. Uh, I think the candidate with the most votes should always be guaranteed to be elected president of the United States and I think that presidential campaigns should be forced to fight for the hearts and minds of every American voter no matter what precinct they live in, no matter what state they reside in. And I think we should take this opportunity to right-size the political influence of battleground state voters who have all of the influence with the American president, while flyover state voters, too often Minnesota voters, are ignored in the general election campaign for president. Uh, I'm here because I believe the interstate compact makes sense for my home state of Minnesota. I think it makes sense for the, uh, the United States of America. And I think it gives every voter a voice in directing 270 electoral votes towards the candidate of their choice. I think Republicans can win under that system. I think Democrats can win under this system. But I don't think this should be about politics. I think it should about, be about policy and what's in the best interest of our country moving forward. How the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact works is when states with 270 or more electoral votes pass our bill, right, have it in place on July 20th of a presidential year, those compacting states award their electors in block to the candidate who wins the most popular votes in all 50 states in the District of Columbia. I think Senator Hoffman and Secretary Simon uh, did a good job of, of talking about how this isn't a theory. It's been fully vetted by legal counsel pretty much in all 50 states. It's been passed by 15 state legislatures in the District of Columbia. It has states with 195 electoral votes that have passed this bill. That means when states with 75 more electoral votes, and I hope my home state of Minnesota is one of them, pass this bill, we will have a national popular vote for president. And the campaign for the presidency will not be about who wins or loses the battleground state of Florida or Michigan or Pennsylvania. It'll be about what candidate has a message of resonance that resonates most with the most American voters and will elect a president of the United States, not just the battleground states. Small state voters will matter. Big state voters will matter. Urban voters will matter. Rural voters will matter. Uh, every American voter will have a real and equal voice in presidential campaigns. And frankly, I think we'll all get a little bit better at living with the results. You know, because if our candidate wins or loses, you know, my candidates have lost elections before. And, uh, you know, what I do is get organized and try to win the next one. So I hope you'll all support the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, and I'm grateful for my time. Thank you, Mr. Rosenstiel. Um, Sarah Bertzinger is next. Hi, my name is Sarah Bertzinger, um, and I've come to speak in opposition to SF-538. As you, know, this is, this, as you know, this country is a constitutional republic made up of individuals and sovereign states, meaning that we the people elect leaders who govern within the confines of our constitution. The constitution was drafted not to limit people, but government. In their wisdom, our foreign founders knew ultimate power ultimately corrupted, which is why every effort was made to localize and limit government for better transparency and accountability. Again, as you know, in the Electoral College system, each individual state combines the number of U.S. Senators and representatives to get their total electoral vote. In Minnesota, we get 10. So how are we going to award these 10 votes? Give them to the most popular candidate nationwide or follow the concept this nation was founded on, local limited control, where local individuals know the issues at hand and vote accordingly. If we were truly to follow our nation's founding concept, each congressional district would award their vote to whichever candidate won in said district, and only the two Senate votes would go to the state popular vote. Instead of promoting our local voice to be heard, this national public vote runs in the exact opposite direction. The national popular vote awards preference not to individuals, but to the collective, to areas where there is high dense population. This bill would disfranchise much of our country in preference to high populated states. We have 10 votes, and we need you to protect our voice and our statehood. As a child, I had the opportunity to grow up in a number of West African countries, mostly in Cameroon. I loved living out in the bush. The people are amazing, hardworking, and resourceful. Community was everything, because it's all we had. All too often, the governments in and around where I lived put the preference of the populated cities above the needs of those living out in the bush. 
The people I lived among were forgotten by their government because there was no representation provided. The popular over the minority is what I witnessed. This is why I value our country, our state, and our constitution so much. America was founded on hearing the voice of the people across the state and the country. America was founded on localized governance. What I find disturbing is this push to centralize government and elections. The national popular vote movement does not give fair or equal representation to America as a whole, but rather centralizes voice and power to all of those living in a few mega cities. The interests and needs of most of America will be ignored, including Minnesota. You were elected to represent, protect, and uphold the voice of this state. The national popular vote goes in direct violation to state rights. Therefore, I ask you to reject this bill in its entirety. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Birchinger. But before you leave, I, I need to ask one thing of all the testifiers that please sign in the note there that, uh, that you've testified. Thank you very much. Next testifiers are Sean Parnell and Todd Otis. And what I'm going to do to help is uh, we have a timer here, and she tells me when, when the three minutes are up. And I'm going to put up my hand like this to kind of give you a feel that uh, I'm going to interrupt you soon. So thank you. Uh, Mr. Parnell, and please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Sure. Uh, I'm Sean Parnell. I'm with People for Opportunity. I'm here to testify against this bill. Um, I'll keep my comments brief. Uh, I really want to focus on the severe defects in this compact as it is written. Uh, the biggest defect is simply that there actually is not a official national popular vote count. What the compact instead proposes is to create a pseudo national vote tally uh, that they will then use to award the presidency. But because every state has its own election code, its own process for uh, casting votes, counting votes, reporting votes, you simply cannot easily uh, or fairly add votes across state lines that have been cast under very different circumstances. Uh, probably one of the biggest problems with this is ranked choice voting. The compact assumes that every single state in the nation is going to uh, produce a single vote total for every candidate. Under ranked choice voting, of course, there are two vote totals, at least. There's the initial vote total, and there's the final vote total. These vote totals can be different by tens or even hundreds of thousands of votes. And the compact gives no guidance on which vote total is to be used. If you have a close national election, what you wind up with is a situation where the officials who are supposed to concoct this national vote tabulation, they get to choose. They get to decide, do we go with the initial vote totals or do we go with the final vote totals? Uh, another problem that this creates is when you have a third party candidate, like a Ross Perot, who finishes in second place in a state using ranked choice voting. Uh, Ross Perot actually finished in second place in both Maine and in Utah in 1992. What happens then is the candidate who finishes in third place, the Republican or the Democrat, the final vote total, if that is the vote total that is going to be used, is zero. So in 1992, if Maine had used ranked choice voting, then what would have happened is George W. Bush would have had about 207,000 votes erased from the national total. If you have a close national election, needless to say, this is going to be a very serious problem. Uh, you also have the problem that other states, uh, New York in particular, are not necessarily going to produce an accurate vote total. In the last four presidential elections, New York has provided vote totals that would be used under the compact that have been missing tens or even hundreds of thousands of votes. It was about 425,000 votes that New York was missing off of its uh, 2012 certificate of ascertainment. Again, in a close election, 425,000 missing votes, that's going to be a problem. You also have the problem that, frankly, states can sometimes do some kind of strange things that don't really affect it uh, uh, under the current system, but under national popular vote would be a disaster. Uh, Donald Trump, because California accidentally gave every uh, Trump voter two votes in 2016 through a bad ballot design, uh, Donald Trump, under the counting mechanism of the compact, would have won because they gave him an extra four and a half million votes. 
That seems kind of outrageous to me. I'll Thank end you, right Mr. there. Parnell. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, uh, Mr. Parnell, be sure oh, yes. to sign up on the list there. Uh, Mr. Todd Otis. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, I'm Todd Otis. I'm uh, co-chair of Clean Elections Minnesota and a former legislator. So it's kind of fun to be in front of the Senate. Uh, I served with three of the people on your committee. Uh, and I am here in strong support of this piece of legislation. I also want to reference a letter that was sent to you, Mr. Chair, from George Beck, the founder of Clean Elections Minnesota, which contains many excellent points. Uh, I guess I'd like to start by saying in the Capitol there is enshrined this phrase, the voice of the people is the voice of God. Every single citizen's voice needs to be counted in a democratic election. And I think I envy you the opportunity to vote for this bill. One of the, the residues of bad policy at the beginning of the country can be corrected through national popular vote. And I think the notion, the simple notion that majority rules should guide your vote. If you believe in the concept of majority rules in a democracy, you vote for the bill. I mean, it's really basic. If you think it's okay to have the most important person in the free world elected by not the majority of the votes, I don't understand. So I, I think the idea of going around the country and only focusing on swing states, ignoring Mississippi, Utah, New York, California, you learn from being a candidate. You all know that. You hear different perspectives from being a candidate. As you listen, you're here because you did listen. And if you're only listening to swing states, you're not hearing the whole story. So I really encourage you to vote for this for that reason as well. We're in a situation where people need to believe in this system again. We need to be able to tell people we live in a democracy where majority rules for every single office, including president. So I think that what you have in front of you is an opportunity to also affirm that, that it's a majority rule country. It's the basis for everything that we have here. So um, I don't have anything else to say. I, I just really think you're on the precipice of a significant and very positive act, supporting the notion of majority rules, passing this piece of legislation, and helping us get closer to a more perfect union. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Otis. Next testifier is Annette Meeks from the Freedom Foundation of Minnesota. Please be sure to sign in. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Annette Meeks, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Freedom Foundation of Minnesota, and I thank you very much for allowing me uh, time to talk about this. We spend a lot of time at the Freedom Foundation focusing on government transparency, which is what brings me here today. I don't need to tell you we're living in a difficult time in our republic. Our elections are too often surrounded by controversy, partisan suspicion, and demands for greater accountability. For many of us who have volunteered, worked, or even run for office in this highly charged political atmosphere, one guiding principle in Minnesota has served us extremely well. Whether there's been a Republican or a DFLer in the governor's office, we prided ourselves on the bipartisan nature when we make changes to our state election laws. This has been the case for many, many decades, and I've been thinking it's really worth focusing on today as you consider not only the highly divisive political climate we're operating in, but frankly, this legislation. I believe all of us would agree that any changes to election law should provide greater confidence to voters in how our elections are carried out, but more importantly, provide greater transparency for all Minnesotans. We're proud of our voter engagement here, always highest turnout in the nation, and until recently, we're really proud of the high ethical standards that have guided our elections and provided a solid bipartisan way forward uh, to our elected officials. I fear that by Minnesota joining the National Popular Vote Compact is what has thus far always been a partisan agreement 
or what is thus far a partisan agreement between 15 states and DC in how we select our president and vice president will not reflect that bipartisan agreement that we've had guiding our state's election law so well for many decades. Instead, I fear this partisan effort will further weaken the bipartisan nature of our state's election laws. One of the Compact's co-founders, Vikram Amar, conceded in 2020 the plan has a real credibility problem. He said in that interview, and I quote, it has to break through in a red state both to get over the top to 270 and also to give the plan any real credibility. It can't be a plan that's favored only by blue states but not by red states, and that's not the way to do election reform, he conceded. I and many millions of Minnesotans couldn't agree more. Election law changes, especially important changes as to how Minnesota would award, award our 10 state electors in future presidential elections, should be part of a strong bipartisan effort by all of you with the House and with our governor. We should have field hearings throughout the state, and we should work on a broad bipartisan consensus that determines that whatever you come up with is the best way to amend the U.S. Constitution and that Minnesotans are fully informed as to this change as we move forward with the 2024 presidential election. The risk to do otherwise will only serve to embolden those who believe we can no longer solve our tough issues in bipartisan ways. Years ago, Mr. Chairman, I'll conclude with this. I said something horrible on a radio interview. I was referring to President Barack Obama in a very heated political debate, and I said, well, he's your president. And my Democrat opponent said, stop. He is our president. And you know what? She was right. He was our president. He's all of our presidents. And we need to make sure that, that, nation's, that our nation's system of checks and balances continues so that we all have confidence that our next president will be all of our president, too. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Meeks. Next uh, testifier is Manolin Hooley. And after that is Elna Niehoff. Hello, thank you, Mr. Chair. Manilin Hool, um, testifying here. First off, I want to say thank you all. I'm here to testify in support of Senate File 538. As an enrolled member of Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, it strikes me that I entered this room and as a citizen of Minnesota differently than many people in this room. The promise that we were founded as a nation didn't include my ancestors. We were not at the table. We have not been at the table for a very long time. When we entered into treaties with the United States government and the state of Minnesota, we did so in the belief of what the American democracy was founded on. That one person, one vote, and that we all matter. When we put our land into trust to the government of the United States, it was in belief that we were gonna be able to participate equally, just like any other citizen of the United States. As a young native person, I find it very striking that I get to go and vote, and that one vote means something. Currently, with the Electoral College, it means nothing. So I'm here to say this bill is about a simple thing. It's about equality, and ensuring that every person has a vote and that it's counted equally. And it's also about ensuring the trust that the American people put into our democracy. And as a Native American and a proud enrolled member of Fond du Lac, I hope that Minnesota joins this compact to reinstill trust in the promises that we made generations ago and continue to make today. So with that, I just want to say thank you, and I hope that you move forward on this bill. Thank you, Mr. Gould. Now we have uh, Elna Nigoff. Good evening, my name, uh, good evening, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Lena Nihoff. I'm a registered nurse from Rochester, Minnesota. I testify in opposition to Bill 538. Our founding fathers designed the electoral college to protect the voices of we, the people. They created the constitutional republic, not democracy. We are constitutional republic. 
It's a form of government where all power resides in we, the people. The electoral college system upholds our constitutional republic and ensure that the voices of all 50 states are heard when, chosen, when choosing our president or vice president. And it, it discourages voter fraud and centralized control over elections. Bill 538 blatantly disregards the Constitution of the United States. It forces the states to disregard the vote of the people and choose president and vice president based on the national popular vote. National popular vote system is designed to bring centralization of power over voting. Other thing is, it's called the communism. Centralized power was the biggest concern of our founding fathers. I would like to quote John Adams, to expect self-denial from men when they have a majority in their favor, and consequently power to gratify themselves is to disbelieve all history and universal experience, is to disbelieve Revelation and the word of God, which informs us the heart is deceitful and above all things desper desperately wicked, Jeremiah 17, 9. There is no man as blind as not to see that to talk of founding a government upon uh, the supposition that nations and great bodies of men left to themselves will practice a course of self-denial is either to babe like a newborn infant or to deceive like an unprincipled imposter. That's the wisdom from our founding fathers. I ask you to vote no on Bill 538. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Niehoff. Uh, next is uh, Leif Larson. Please identify yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. Yes. I am Leif Larson from Rochester, Minnesota. Pleased to be here today. We've heard, actually our country, our government, referred to as the greatest democracy in the world. But then many have also said our constitutional republic. And there is a difference. There's a real difference. But for even our Secretary of State to say the greatest democracy in the world causes me some concerns because that's very fundamental. We have a constitutional republic given to us by our forefathers who had seen Europe destroyed by centralized power uh, and ruined through endless wars. And at a point in time, they came over to a new land. They were very wise and they designed something for us to make it as much strong as possible to resist tyranny. But they also had the wisdom to know it would be a battle and the Founding Fathers said, we've given you a constitutional republic if you can keep it. And it's been under attack since day one. Uh, as senators, I believe you have all taken an oath to the Constitution to uphold it. And I think that's good that you have done that. Uh, but it's important to know how crucial our Constitution is and that we are a republic. Uh, it's, where is it in the educational system today? The federal curriculum, you know, which everyone can choose or reject, but if you want the funding, you take it. And generation after generation has been produced that doesn't have a clue even what it is. It's not mentioned at all or much of the early history of our country. That is a big concern to me. Uh, so I think it's, it's very important to just to realize uh, 
on the surface, what looks good might not really be good. And it's very important before changing something clearly put in the Constitution to know why it was put in there that way. Uh, so uh, even the Constitution, I would say, I've lived overseas for actually uh, 14 years. Our Constitution is the envy of the world. And when Hillary Clinton was overseas and someone asked about our Constitution, she said, oh, <laughs> that archaic document. <laughs> so it shows there is not much regard for it because it is under attack. So anyway, I just encourage you all to see the big picture. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Larson. Uh, next testifier is Paul Huffman from the League of Women Voters of Minnesota. Uh, thank you, Chair Carlson and committee members. Uh, I'm Paul Huffman, League of Women Voters of Minnesota, a board member, voter service chair, and also a member of our League of Women Voters Woodbury Cottage Grove area board. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak today on behalf of voters in supporting Senate File 538. Uh, I also reference uh, letters sent to uh, Chair Carlson and uh, members from our Executive Director of League of Women Voters Minnesota, Michelle Witte. Um, League of Women Voters will be 103 years old in February. Our members are proud to be nonpartisan, neither supporting nor opposing candidates or political parties at any level of government, always working on behalf of all voters toward a democracy where every eligible citizen, citizen has the opportunity, the knowledge, and the confidence to participate in our elect elections. I want to start by saying that the League of Women Voters of the United States believes in representative government. The League specifically supports electoral systems that elect policy-making bodies that proportionally reflect the people they represent. We believe the National Popular Vote Compact is another in a series of important course corrections for our electoral system. These changes have occurred periodically as our country has changed and evolved, and as we have learned and grown as a society to understand how to better ensure our government represents all the people. This has included legislation such as the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the National Voter Registration Act of 1992, and the Bipartisan Help America Vote Act in 2002. In Minnesota, this has included such things as providing election day voter registration and expanding uh, the use of electronic tabulators to ensure voters know that their ballots are accurately read, counted, and received. And the courts, noteworthy, is this is included declaring that unequal populations between legislative or congressional districts is unconstitutional as it fails to ensure that each person's vote, their voice, is counted equally. The people of Minnesota have historically worked together as citizens and legislatures to learn and update our laws as needed to ensure that voters are able to freely cast their ballot, have their ballots count accurately, and most important, to protect the competent voters that their votes and their voices matter. Just as a healthy economy depends on strong consumer confidence, so a healthy electoral system requires strong voter confidence that their vote matters. Similar to the historical practice of population gerrymandering, where there are severe imbalances between legislative or congressional districts, our current system weighs the vote of less populous states as much as four to five times more than those of the most populous states. It also ensures that candidates will only campaign in and be responsive to those states which are most competitive and not in states which are firmly decided toward one candidate or the other. We have clear evidence that the current electoral college system is not honoring intentional voters, and Minnesota has a real opportunity through the National Piper Vote Compact to ensure our presidential elections reflect the voices of all the people while maintaining the integrity of our current election system. Thank you for your thoughtful consideration. Thank you, Mr. Huffman. Uh, next testifier is Ray Parker. And Casey McGregor should be on base or on, on deck. Ms. Good Parker. afternoon. Thank you. My name is Ray Parker. I'm from Rochester, Minnesota. And I'm here to voice my opinion against SF 538 the bill that will take away state rights, state voices, and the voices of small rural areas and small communities, and will nullify the state popular vote. Taking away the Electoral College, or at least overrunning the Electoral College, by signing a pact with other states within whom all 
have differing laws for voting. Laws such as early voting, registering to vote or not, who qualifies for the ballot, felony voting, absentee mail-in voting, non-citizen voting, underage voting, dead people voting, unsecured voting, differing recount thresholds, all that can lead to voter fraud with no say in how to protect our vote. This bill takes away the sovereignty of our state and the voice of its people. The Electoral College, although flawed, is the best option for us, not the national popular vote. The national popular vote would cater only to the large cities throughout the country, leaving rural areas and states with low populations at a disadvantage and never getting proper representation or even a vote that will be heard. We don't need a monopoly on votes, and that is what the national popular vote would give us. The state has its popular vote when the people of our state vote for the candidates they want. Then the electoral vote goes to that popular candidate, not to the candidate that won popular vote in Texas or California or New York or others, but for Minnesota. Then each state has their say on what their populace wants and gives their electoral college vote for that candidate. This is as fair as it gets. We declare our own voting laws. We vote for the candidate that the majority under fair and safe elections has declared the best. Hopefully all can understand this voting freedom. Vote no to SF 538. Vote no to MPV. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Parker. Next testifier, Casey McGregor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Casey McGregor, Rochester. I'm uh, here speaking against SF 538. This is theft. Theft of the voices of Minnesotans. In Minnesota, we have 87 counties. In the 2022 governor election on the election map, 13 counties are blue, 74 counties are red, yet the DFL is in control. This is popular voting. 39.5 million in California versus 5.71 million in Minnesota per the last census. Minnesota would lose their voice to other states, just like 74 counties here in Minnesota. No amendments, no compromises on bills. The people in red counties are already living in this nightmare. I don't understand why either team, red or blue, you'd want to lose your voice to California, Texas, and Florida, the top three in population census. Why would you want this for Minnesota? Please vote no on Bill SF38. It is the theft of voices of all Minnesotans. Thank you, Ms. McGregor. Next testifier is David, David Fisher. Please state your name for the record and continue with your testimony. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is David Fisher. I'm here to speak on behalf uh, and in support of Senate File 538. I teach at the University of Minnesota Law School. I'm on the board of Minsher and a former commissioner of administration. My purpose in talking in favor of this bill is to ensure that a majority of voters in our republic our democratic republic actually elect the president of the United States. As Senator Hoffman has previously stated, 15 states and the District of Columbia have adopted this law. Jurisdictions that together represent 72% or more than 72% of those electoral votes needed to elect a president. We would add to that number here. Our electoral system, college system, has allowed candidate to candidates to lose the national popular vote, to nevertheless win the presidency five times in our nation's history. And there have been two near misses. I uh, recommend you to 20, the year 2020 and 2004. And the system encourages presidential campaigns to focus disproportionately on a limited set of swing states where small changes in the popular vote 
can produce large changes in the electoral college vote. A study by Fair Vote shows that in 2004, candidates can find three-fourths of their peak season campaign resources to just five states, while the other 45 states receive little attention and only 18, and 18 states receive no candidate visits and no TV advertising at all. In effect, the electoral college system disenfranchised almost 300 mil, or 3 million voters in 2016 and almost did so again in 2020 for over 7 million voters because their votes were not relevant to the outcome in the electoral college. It's a fundamental principle of representative government that ultimate power is held by the people who alone select their representatives. It's even enshrined in our Constitution in the very purpose of our decennial census. It defies Lincoln's charge of a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. For these reasons, I urge you to support Senate File 538 and instill integrity to our presidential electoral process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Relford. Next testifier is, uh, I don't know if I've got this right, uh, John Wilcox, is that correct? Or are you Matt? I'm Matt. You're Matt, okay, Matt Belford. Okay, Mr. Fisher just testified. Thank you, so Mr. Please Chair. Please state your name for the record. And yep, my name is Matt discuss. Belford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Senators. I'm from Cannon Falls, Minnesota. Uh, why are we here? We're here to discuss a bill that will subsequently, if approved by enough states, will potentially take away the voices of the majority of Minnesotans on who they desire to serve as our president, commander in chief. Why are we here? We're here for a bill that if approved by Minnesota and enough other states equaling 270 electoral votes will fundamentally alter our country to the very core. When I, my neighbors, my family members go to the polls in November to elect the president, if Minnesota decides as a state that we want this president, but more people in larger population states as have already been mentioned, California, New York, Texas, Florida, want a different president, also played by a different set of election rules, our voices in Minnesota and especially all the smaller states will have been null and void. Why are we even considering this? Our founders feared the tyranny of the majority. When this bill is proposing exactly what our founders did not want, a law where 51% could control the 49%, where the heaviest populated states ruled. They realized the tremendous importance everyone's voice is to build a country of the people, by the people, and for the people. Every American's voice counts. We will not tolerate being silenced in our voting booth for our president. The fact is, this is what Great Britain was doing when our country was founded, and we need to not tolerate it back then, and we will not tolerate it today. This bill is not progress, it's regress. But that's why I'm here today, to remind you of what has worked for over 247 years and what has not worked from where we came from, Great Britain. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Belford. Next testifier is John Wilcox. Thank you, Mr. State Chairman. your name for the record and continue with your testimony. Thank you, members of the committee. My name is John Wilcox and I come from Cannon Falls. I stand here in opposition to Senate Bill 538. As a student of our nation's history, I am fascinated by our uh, founders' knowledge and foresight. Each of them brought a passion and zeal to the floor where issues were often tirelessly worked through. One thing stands out among those debates, and that was their unwavering defense of liberty that any article, any resolution, or amendment must safeguard the rights of every citizen. As representatives, they had to take a stand against anything that presented itself as a threat to those liberties. When I examine the current issues facing our state legislature, I am concerned that a direction is being set forth that appears to ignore the potential devastating effects of this bill. I suggest that this is because we are a people that have not lived under the oppressive taxation or power yielded by a single power, as did our forefathers. As such, they established safeguards that would protect the states against an individual or a group of individuals 
from forcing their will upon the masses. Such was the case with the strategy and implementation of the Electoral College. For those who consider the National Popular Vote Compact to be the answer, I offer the following concerns. Typical supporters of NPVC, the National Popular Vote Compact, have tied the fate of Democratic presidential candidates as a means of assuring their candidate's success. Since the partisan divide is what drives the NP, NPVC movement, what happens when the electorate shifts to the opposite party? How will the presidential elections be resolved if pressure by this shift causes them to withdraw from the NPVC? What happens if the national popular vote is close? What if a state or group of states demands a recount? The NPVC motto is one man, one vote, but it's just the opposite. What happens if no candidate gains the required popular votes? Is a state forced to compromise with other states to satisfy that requirement? Or is that decision left to one elected state official? In my estimation, this bill will not only strip power away from the people, but it will grant additional power to a few elected officials within our state government. It will create the very thing our founders warned about. Such power goes against our founding principles, and rather than have a representative government, will move us toward mob rule. It is my sincere hope that this body will look deeply into the possibilities that no one not even the members of this chamber will be untouched by the passage of SF 538. In my opinion, Minnesota will become a flyover state. Many of its citizens will be eliminated or alienated, and our state will lose the ability to competitively participate in broad interstate negotiations with the success it has historically experienced. That's my comments. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. And now we have uh, the honor of having uh, Vermont State Senator Chris Pearson. Senator Pearson, please identify yourself for the record and continue with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and members of the committee, to our sponsor. Uh, until a few weeks ago, I was a Vermont State Senator. We served three terms and several terms in the House before that. It's an honor to be here with you. Um, I work on behalf of National Popular Vote. During my service, it was my day job, and I'm glad to continue that role. A lot has been said today, um, and I want to just try to clear up some misperceptions that have been put out there. Uh, I'll start with the Constitution. It's been suggested that this is an affront to the Constitution. I think it's important to actually look at the Constitution and to recognize that it says, in fact, very little about how we elect the president. It, makes it clear that you have to have a majority of the electors to go to the White House. And then Article 2, Section 1 gives the role to you. Article 2, Section 1 says, each state shall appoint as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. Minnesota curr currently uses the winner-take-all rule. Most states do that, 48 states at the present, but Maine and uh, Nebraska do it differently. Only three states used the winner-take-all rule at the very first election of our country. They all went on to repeal it. And for decades, states were trying all sorts of different things with this power that they had over the electors. The plain fact is states control how the Electoral College works. We heard that there's no such thing as an official national popular vote count. That would be a big problem if we were trying to determine that the national popular vote winner uh, was going to become president. But of course, there are 50 official counts, well, 51 when you include the District of Columbia, and we can all do the math. Similarly, we've been told that there is no guidance uh, what would happen under uh, national popular vote when we look at states that use a ranked choice ballot, for instance, Maine, or we've been told that officials will get to decide. That would leave an awful lot to choice, to chance. 
Um, and it is simply not true. The National Popular Vote Compact in front of you says, quote, the chief election official of each member state shall treat as conclusive an official statement containing the number of popular votes in a state for each presidential slate. So Secretary Simon is not gonna be put in a position of judging the vote totals from Maine, as an example. He will simply record the totals that come out of Maine. It's also been suggested that, that uh, Ranked Choice prepares, uh, presents multiple totals, but, but no official is gonna hand voters a ballot and ask them to rank candidates and then only look at the first choice. That would be preposterous. And so, in this case, Maine would do its ranked choice voting. As we've heard today, states do election law differently. And Maine will come up with the total, and that total will feed the national total uh, uh, should this bill be governing the election. We've heard that big states will control the outcome. And, and New York, California, Florida, and Texas have been named the four biggest states. But of course, if you sometimes we hear our opponents say California and New York will control the election, they only have 18% of the population, and they are not a monolith. And you have to also include Texas and Florida, so two red states, two blue states. When we have a national popular vote, when every vote is equal and the candidate with the most votes is guaranteed to win, the contest becomes about margins everywhere. And I would suppose that the margins out of New York and California will be nicely balanced by the margins out of Florida and Texas, and therefore candidates will compete uh, for every vote everywhere because they will be looking at margins everywhere. If you're running for governor of your state, I think it's safe to say you don't just hang out in the Twin Cities and Duluth. You pro approach rural, rural voters because their voice matters, and in fact, there's a lot of rural voters. Uh, you get a flavor today of what our opponents come up with because it's hard to counter the simple fact every vote should be equal. When you get the votes, most votes you win. That is what National Popular Vote delivers, and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Senator Pearson. I'm, I'm going to ask maybe if you want to hang out up there for a while and help uh, Senator Hoffman uh, answer some questions. So we're going to move to uh, uh, the Q&A section right now. And uh, uh, let's see. I think, uh, you know, questions from the members. Uh, Senator Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a ton of questions and comments. Um, I don't even know where to start. I suppose let's start with the fact that we're a constitutional republic as opposed to a democracy. Well, democracy is often referred to as mob rule. We've heard all of these phrases today, but what, what actually makes us a constitutional republic as opposed to the democracy? Um, we're seeing in this legislature right now democracy. We have one party controls the House, the Senate, and the governor's mansion. Um, the constitutional republic aspect of this would be um, it divides. You have to compromise. You have to work together. You must. Um, it, the, the constitution part of the republic protects the rights. It, in is Our U.S. Constitution lists out what Congress may do. Nothing, not what they could do if they want to. These are the only things you get to act on. And we have had activist courts systematically tear that apart to where the last um, last line in the enumerated powers has turned into the good and plenty clause, which anything you feel like you need to do to uh, keep the Constitution alive you, alive, you can act on. So that's, that's just a first piece. Um, this national popular vote will actually destroy state, state sovereignty. And when it comes into the, uh, the question of uh, nothing in the Constitution prevents this, I actually have a question. And uh, I don't know if either the, the author or the testifier there can answer it, but under Article 1, Section, Section 10, Clause 1, no state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, or confederation. Well, this sounds to me like you're actually entering into an alliance or uh, with other states. So that's, 
Do you want me to just go back and forth, Mr. Right. Chair? Because I have a few more comments and questions I'd like to ask. Well, if you can round off the question and then we can see yeah, if we'll there's go an answer. One okay. at a time. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the good senator from Vermont, and uh, I forgot my good and plenty um, uh, licorice, so I'll get to that. That's all right. Thanks. Thank you. I appreciate it. We'll get it next time. Sure. Thank you, Senator. So I think your question refers to the compacts clause, right? Uh, um, I have a handout, actually, that comes from the Council of State Governments here. I'd be glad to submit uh, that details some of this. But you're right. The Constitution is very clear that no state shall enter into a compact without the approval of com Congress. It seems very straightforward. In fact, the court history is equally clear that Congress does not need to approve an interstate compact unless that compact is infringing on federal powers. Because the choosing and awarding of electors is, is a plenary power belonging to the state, uh, to states, we don't believe that there is a requirement to have Congress approve this. Nevertheless, um, we're not opposed to that. We, we talk to members of Congress. Uh, they may well approve this. It is typical that uh, Congress consents to a compact after uh, the threshold of states that is often involved in an interstate compact is met. And, and so that uh, is also the plan to pursue that. Thank you. Senator Barr. Mr. Chair, if I could interject quickly. Just Senator, a question to this Senator point. Brand. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would love to have the, uh, we're, we're discussing thoughts, opinions, and views of the Constitution. I would like um, to have an opposing view as well. So if Mr. Parnell could come up, I would love that if we're going to have an equal debate about the merits of this bill and its impact on our, on our voting and our election system and our Constitution. Senator Hoffman, would that be... Uh Mr. Chair, absolutely. I mean, this is this is what you know democracy is all about. Let's get into the. There, there are many times uh, Senator Barr and I disagree mm -hmm. a lot, uh, but yet at the same time, we're going to have a good conversation on this because getting to the the fact, Mr. Chair, on plenary powers versus you know constitutional republic divides. I mean, this is an academic debate, and I think Senator Rush should come over here and hang out and give us a, a little. <laughs> conversation too. Thank you, Senator. I Rock. actually have to go. I have another bill I have to present in another committee. So maybe Senator Rest, if you want to come over here. I know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is it Mr. Parnell? Yes. Okay. Um, do you have uh, some input on this? this sure. Question? On the specific issue of, uh, I mean, you. this is an interstate compact. This Constitution does state that, uh, you know, Congress has to approve interstate compacts. Chris is correct that there is case law suggesting or indicating that that isn't true in every single case. Uh, people that I've talked with have said this one probably does require congressional approval because it infringes on, or, or at least affects, I'll be kind here, uh, it affects other states. So one of the things that we hear quite frequently is that, uh, you know, it's not fair that Wyoming has, you know, three electoral votes, California only has 55, this, you know, is, is out of whack, California should have more, Wyoming should have less of a voice. Because the compact takes away the, uh, the, the influence, the oversight, overweight of Wyoming's voice, it affects Wyoming, which is not a party to the compact and is pretty unlikely to ever become a part of the compact. Because of that, because of its effect on non-member states, it may, and, and this is the sort of thing that, you know, judges, you know, will eventually have to sort of figure out all of this stuff, but it may, in fact, require congressional consent. Thank you. Uh, uh, Senator Pearson. Thank you. I, I would just say that that's actually been tried uh, in the 1960s. Delaware led a contingent of predominantly small states challenging New York then uh, a key battleground state and obviously a large state. Uh, Delaware and others uh, tried to take them to the Supreme Court to say their use of the winner-take-all rule is infringing on our power, and the court refused to hear it because it's a plain state power as outlined in the Constitution. Which did not involve an interstate compact. Mr. President. Yep, Prior, sir. Yep. Please be sure that we uh, recognize you, or and also My say, say your name as much as possible to okay. me, because we this is recorded, and uh, so people won't be able to see you speak. They want to be able to 
know who is who is speaking. So thank you. Uh, Senator Grant, do you have a follow up? And okay, it's Senator Barr. Next question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we've heard one one voter, one vote, or one vote, one voter, uh, a few times as well. What the what the this compact actually does is consolidate power. It doesn't actually empower single voters. It consolidates that into uh, each voter having less actual influence on what's going on the, on the outcome because this is all consolidated. And I'm going to give you an example of what I think should happen because I do recognize that there are the winner take all scenario is a problem. I think it's a problem anyway. I prefer, which has been kind of sideswiped a few times today, Maine and Nebraska's approach. Because then you end up, I'll give you Minnesota as an example. This last election, we would have actually awarded six electoral college votes to Joe Biden, and we would have awarded four to Donald Trump. So the winner of the state would get the, gets the two Senate votes, and each congressional district whoever wins has the most votes for the president in the congressional district or the electoral district, which is the same, would be awarded to that. And then you actually, your one vote, one voter, one voter, one vote thing actually comes closer to being reality as opposed to we're going to have approximately 350 million people, 330 million people in the union. Then we over, a little over half to get your compacting gear or get it actually enacted. So somewhere in the ballpark of 175, 180 million people, and I'm one vote in that 180, and it's all or nothing. So we've heard uh, uh, heard come, you know, just all or nothing is bad. Well, now I'm going to be not all or nothing of 10. I'm going to be all or nothing of. 272 or 280 or 290, however many states go into the compact. So I'm only one of that. That's diffusing my voice and it's consolidating power. Um, gerrymandering was brought up. Gerrymandering is only relevant when we award more and more power to a centralized authority. The, le the more power that's retained at a local level, whether it's a state or a county or a city, makes gerrymandering almost irrelevant at that point. So a few comments on that. I'm sure many of the other members, I'm probably burning way too much of my time, but for that and a myriad of other reasons, I will be opposing this. But I would love to have a more in-depth conversation with offline with the uh, author, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Barr. Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Hoffman. I, I love that, and, and I look forward to that, uh, Senator Barr. It's, it's, it's interesting has that he brings up the same argument that we've heard, right? And, and in 2020 election alone, one billion, over one billion dollars was spent on 13 states, just in ad buys, right? And, and David Schultz, who's at Hamlin, you guys have probably heard of David Schultz. Um, every year he would do a, a, this is how the votes have broken out of the United States. And he actually, he broke it down to one state and he actually broke it down to two counties where this, this massive influx of attention was because those were the deciding votes. And so I think my argument on one person, one vote and, and Senator Barr's are opposite, but I can absolutely understand where he's coming from. And from my point, I'm, I'm sick of Minnesota, North Dakota, Iowa, South Dakota being those flyover states, and that's, that's the point. That billion dollars plus on 13 states, that's absolutely beyond. I could tell you what, that billion dollars, Mr. Chair, did you know there's $1.825 billion sitting in the reserve that should be spent in human services? I'd take that billion dollars right now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. And you're, I think you said that you only had to repeat that seven times. So this is about 11. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, other, uh, Mr. Chair? Other questions. Uh, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I thought this would be a good chance to jump in because Senator Barr just stole most of what I was wanting to say. Uh, but I agree with the, you know, we're, we're, it's a fundamental question here that we're asking. And I do have a fundamental disagreement about that it's, that it's difficult to defend the electoral college position because of what's stated in the Constitution. And I, uh, I posit the opposite theory uh, that the National Popular Vote Compact detracts 
from what the constitutional system set up in place. I mean, we heard the arguments uh, early on uh, from the secretary, who I don't think is here anymore, like the hypothetical examples, we could pick the tallest person or we could pick whatever members, if we really believed that, which one of us actually thinks that something that ludicrous would hold up in court? Absolutely, there are uh, there are avenue, constitutional avenues to guide us to ensure that the will of the people uh, is chosen for this. And the National Popular Vote Compact, by my read and by my study, goes around the constitutional system of the Electoral College that's spelled out in the Constitution. And if you want to replace it with a national popular vote, I believe you need to do it with a national constitutional amendment because right now we're just in a game of semantics, like a parent to a small child who says, mom, my room's not dirty, it's messy. <laughs> well, no, you're, I'm getting at the intent of you need to go forward and do this. And we can say, oh, it's, it's the uh, national popular vote uh, and it's not getting rid of the electoral college. Well, no, it's semantics at that point. It is replacing the electoral college system of each state contributing what that state decides with what the overall uh, nation requires. And my preference too, I, I too struggle with the winner take all system. Uh, my preference also uh, is the Maine and Nebraska model. Uh, let's look at what some possibilities might be. If we have a national popular vote system and we have a Tuesday election day, and I'm gonna keep parties out of this because we've seen it swing both ways in just the recent past on, on this. Let's say we have a national popular vote presidential election on a Tuesday, and any one state, pick any state, could be a big red state, a big blue state, any state, makes an announcement on a Thursday or a Friday or something like that of any of the scenarios that were listed of issues that have come up in the last even recent decade or so, we accidentally under, undercounted someone by a couple hundred thousand votes, or we overcounted someone, or something was done incorrectly, or whether it's a computer glitch, whether it's a true human error, whether it's nefarious, whether it's an oversight. What do you think uh, half the population is going to start saying? And at that point, uh, what we have is that's contained to that state's problem. That state has to figure that out and get that cleaned up and figure out uh, where their vote goes from there. You make this national popular vote, suddenly that becomes a national problem. And if we have a localized system of a winner take all or I would like a district take all method, if there's a problem right here in our local district in pick any one of Minnesota's congressional districts, our voters know right where to go there are local people counting local votes at a local jurisdiction that's accessible with local Minnesota election judges that we can find, that we can talk to, that we can hear from and figure out what's going on, what mistake was made, how can we fix it, and we can isolate uh, that by itself. Who in Minnesota is going to be able to reach any election official in New York or Texas or pick a state that's not often named. What if it's North Carolina? What if it's Nevada or Idaho? How is any Minnesota voter going to reach in and figure out and, uh, what's going on and see if that system's going to be trustworthy? I think this goes backwards in the trustworthy, transparent method. Uh, another reason why I like the district take all approach is because then you will be able to have a trustworthy system of an even vote. Because right now, one voter in Minnesota votes for 10 electoral votes. Uh, a, a voter, uh, an individual in California, his vote goes for 54 electoral votes. If we did a district take all approach, every person in every state, their vote would influence the same number of electoral votes across the board, three the two contributing to the statewide one, and the third for whatever uh, their district selects. So I have serious constitutional and trustworthy issues uh, that um, with 
the national popular vote model. Um, there's a lot in there, Mr. Chair. If Senator Hoffman uh, would like to respond to any of that, uh, that's fine. I may have one quick follow-up question then as well, uh, but I'll, I, was, I know that was a lot for you, Senator Hoffman, and uh, if he wants to respond, I'm fine with that, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Senator Chair, and Senator Matthews, thank you. And, and you know, it's, it's, uh, it gets down to that. It was just when you were bringing that up as, as we were sitting here having, having a side conversation um, with uh, Senator Pearson, it was like, well, wait a minute, it's the Electoral College. Is, I mean, it, it comes focused back on the Electoral College. Maybe Senator Pearson, if you want to kind of want to talk about Florida in 2000 or, or maybe add to what the good senator from, um, from the western part, Elk River, it, it, I can't get it, Vincent. <laughs> Senator Matthews was talking about, so I'd, I'd appreciate that. Senator Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chris Pearson. Um, there was a lot in your comments, but I would say um, the idea that a voter in, in Minnesota would have no bearing on <clears throat> something that's happening in another state and under national popular vote, that could have national implications. The ballot design in Dade County, Florida in 2000 had profound national implications. Uh, George W. Bush won Florida. It was determined by 537 votes. He trailed Al Gore by half a million votes. And the entire country lived with the outcome of Florida. And in fact, it swung the nation. So that happens all the time today. Um, and, and routinely, we are forced to as a nation, take the consequences of different election laws in different states. What we're talking about here is empowering citizens in every corner of the country uh, and, and incentivizing candidates to talk to voters across the nation in every state and guaranteeing you get the most votes, you win. You also asked uh, what would what leverage, I think was the word you said, would, would a Minnesota voter have on some outcome in North Carolina that may be impacting the country's outcome. They, a citizen wouldn't have uh, leverage, but a presidential candidate would. And a presidential candidate who felt wronged by the outcome, whether it's under the current system or a national popular vote, has a ready uh, ways to address that through the courts. And in fact, the recent Electoral Count Act in Congress creates a very special system open only to presidential candidates in a very limited uh, and expedited process to address just the kinds of concerns that you're talking about. So, you know, in most cases, critiques of the current system, some of them also apply to national popular vote, but far fewer apply to national popular vote and, and are in fact things that we live with readily today. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Uh, Sean Parnell, uh, a couple of things. Um, so the winner-take-all system, there's nothing special about it. It is what most states have chosen, but uh, Senator Matthews, Senator Barr is are absolutely correct. You can do a lot of different things with your electoral votes. You can do a congressional district system, which has pluses and minuses. You can do a, a proportional system. You can do a threshold system. You can continue to do winner take all. They all have pluses and minuses. If the concern is that Minnesota is not getting its fair share of television advertising from presidential candidates, then there are much simpler fixes that you can adopt. And in fact, you can adopt them in this session and they will be in effect for the 2024 presidential election, whereas the compact, uh, I, I don't, I'm not going to try and speak for NPV, but I, I don't see a scenario where this is in place by 2024 or even 2028. But you know, who knows? Politics can be strange. Uh, but if the winner-take-all system is the problem, then you can fix that immediately without having to wait for a compact that frankly may never go into effect. That's my hope, obviously, that it never goes into effect. So if winner take all is the problem, then fix winner take all and do it now. Uh, the one person, one vote issue was raised. One person, one vote is a very important democratic principle and we have it in the current system. I live in Virginia, when I go and vote, my vote for our presidential electors is equal to every other Virginian. In Minnesota, every Minnesotan's vote is equal to every other Minnesotan. 
we do not have a rigid adherence to one person, one vote, where we demand uh, mathematical perfection and precision. I suspect that most of you are sitting here today having won very different vote totals, very different vote margins. Some of you might have been in competitive districts where there was high turnout. Some of you might have been in you know, safer districts where the turnout wasn't quite as high. And yet you're all here as equals. We do not treat one person, one vote as a rigid mathematical formula. And we also do not treat it as the only democratic principle. Federalism, representation for a broad and diverse set of communities, uh, protections for minority interests and rights, uh, checks on majoritarianism. We have a lot of democratic principles that we roll into our election system up and down the ballot, whether you're voting for a county commissioner or president of the United States. I think it's a mistake to simply try and have this mathematical you know, precision in terms of electing the president when we do not apply that to any other office. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and stop now. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Purnell. Uh, Senator Rest. Thank you. Um, actually, um, we absolutely do. Uh, the um, population of Minnesota is divided into eight congressional districts, and there's uh, there can be a remainder, but otherwise, it definitely is one person, one vote, coming out of Baker versus Carr, and I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, it's not a thing, however. It is not a thing. It is assuring that the people of this country, when they go to vote, whether it's in Virginia, and by the way, I'm a native Virginian, welcome to Minnesota. <laughs> um, uh, it comes about, of course, for, with, with uh, redistricting, as you know, um, in, the, in the various states, so that we did not have uh, what Minnesota had, such lopsided representation where until 1962, and this decision was rendered, um, you had a district in northern Minnesota that could have, what, 15, 16,000 people in it, and the representatives and the senator from that district um, had, had, quote, equal votes with a, a district in Minneapolis, which is 60,000 people. And Baker versus Carr turned that upside down so that every district, legislative district in Minnesota comes within, we allow a deviation greater than, than uh, absolutely equal of, um, I think the law allows something like 1%, but the, but the, the, um, the technology now is, is so advanced that it's, much less than 1% deviation from district to district. And the, um, uh, the, the notion that um, uh, winner takes all is, um, to me at least, is a, um, uh, uh, has, equal consideration from one person, one vote, not just, not just in these geopolitical um, borders that we have, um, where a state is defined by which river is on the western side of it, um, but we're treated, in my mind, we're treated as if there are no geopolitical borders. We're all voting as individual Americans who are citizens. And that seems to me to be a compelling argument, in my mind, uh, with regard to national popular vote, that we first and foremost think of ourselves as Americans, independent of our zip code, independent of our, uh, of our accent, independent of our skin color, our religion, all kinds of factors. But we're here, and we should all be regarded uh, equally 
um, as Americans in making those choices. Um, when we, when the arguments are made, well, we're not really a democracy. Beg pardon? <laughs> we're not a democracy? We hide behind this, this phrase, a constitutional um, uh, republic? I bet you there is not 10 people, if we walked outside of this building, would know what you were talking about if you said that the United States is a constitutional democracy, a constitutional republic. But they would sure know what it meant to say um, we live in a democracy where uh, you mentioned all kinds of principles of fairness. I think those are the kinds of things that, that Minnesotans, as Americans, um, would be bringing up to define uh, justice, equality, equity, et cetera. And I, um, I don't see why that's such a hard concept. Uh, a constitutional uh, republic that is informed by democratic principles. And you named a, um, a number of them. And I, um, uh, I think we, we shouldn't fall all over ourselves with, um, uh, with, a, with a phrase like a, constitution, with, uh, a, a constitutional uh, um, republic. And um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's filled with false equivalencies, um, very, very different than, than the principles within democracy, a, a democracy, that are offered in, um, uh, in national public vote, uh, national public vote, um, popular vote, sorry. Um, and um, I'm just, uh, Senator um, uh, Hoffman has said I'm a strong pr proponent of this approach, whether um, this exactly compact is the best way, um, but the principles that drive it seem to me to be the heart of what it means to be an American. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me um, thank you, Senator make a speech. <laughs> and uh, and I, Chair, I, I, can, I can go around here and know exactly who is going to disagree with me. <laughs> but um, I appreciate being able to, to, uh, to make my comments. And, and uh, quite frankly, I don't intend to engage in a colloquy or um, a debate with our witnesses. But I certainly will with my colleagues and with Senator Hoffman. Thank you very much. If Thank I, you, Senator Ress. If uh, I may, Mr. Chair, um, just briefly. Let's have a real quick response. Sure. I happen to agree with you on the whole democracy versus republic thing that founding fathers essentially used the terms uh, interchangeably. Uh, so I, I do agree with you on that. I think that you said something very important, which is that national popular vote uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it essentially erases the state borders. And I've actually heard uh, advocates for national popular vote talk about that as well. Uh, I think reasonable minds can disagree, but to my mind, that means eliminating the voice of Minnesota. It means eliminating the voice of Virginia. It means eliminating the voices of 50 states plus Washington, D.C. Uh, and I'm happy to have that conversation at some point with uh, any of the members. It really is a matter of, of choosing which principles should be elevated above others. I think the Electoral College takes a bunch of different democratic principles and mixes them up very nicely. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Mr. Purnell. Just, uh, just one final Senator point. Rest. The big difference here uh, this afternoon is that the people sitting up here, we have a vote, and you don't. <laughs> I have nothing to say to that. Uh, Senator Coran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, what's the path that, where's, where's this bill going to after uh, elections? Okay, um, two things. One is uh, we have made arrangements to stay late here, so we're gonna keep, keep speaking, and we're gonna probably uh, pull back from the the testifiers and into the uh, the members, um, and so right now uh, we will probably be staying late. Uh, we will. Are we not going to do the next two bills? Uh, no, we, will. we will do the next two bills. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the yes, and the bill goes to the floor. Here. You're going straight to the floor, Mr. Chair. Just to clarify. We only see one additional bill on the agenda. Okay, so there's 
Is it one or is it two? It's one. It's one, one addition. Okay, thank right. you. Yes. And then, thank with, you. with that, Mr. Chair, I, I, think, I think it's important, and I have to acknowledge, I think there's, you know, sometimes we talk about we know who we agree with and we know who we disagree with in this body uh, pretty, uh, pretty easily. Um, but I have to, I have to uh, say that I agree with uh, um, Paul Huffman with the League of Minnesota Voters, and you likely won't hear that much out of my voice. But, you know, one of the things that he, that he had mentioned was historically working together. And so today we had a, huge, a great debate about how is it that we can value each voter, you know, and I think we've heard a, a great discussion. Um, but I'm, I'm back on the, the, how do we bring trust into the process, transparency? We don't appear to be working in that environment um, across any of the bills that appear to be on the agenda. Um, we don't appear to be doing anything in a bipartisan manner. And I think there's a great opportunity to talk about how we can enrich the value and to get greater, greater buy-in to the process of, of allocating our electoral college votes within Minnesota. I think there's many options. I don't think this is one of them, and certainly not ready for prime time to go straight to the floor. Because I think what it does is, is it sets bad policy. We've had this policy of having, having bipartisan for significant legislative changes. And I think that's been sounded by, I think, I, I think you could probably quote uh, the last few governors. Um, and so I have great concern that we're gonna continue to move forward something this significant. And I think we're gonna move further away from enrichment and belief in the system to disenfranchisement. And so I think it erases our sovereignty. I think, it's, I think there is opportunity to really have a detailed analysis, but I'm not sure anybody's interested in that. And so I, I think this bill isn't ready for prime time. I think we need to do more to, to make sure that everyone here trusts the election results and again, get back to transparency in the actual process itself. But it removes our rights and Minnesota's voice. And I, I do believe, I believe in that constitutional republic and where Minnesota's electoral college goes based on our votes. I do have concerns. We had a great talk about the, 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 uh, a close election. I think the scenario given, Senator Matthews did a great job at articulating um, the complex version of how do, we, how do we resolve differences. And I think we're given an example of in Florida, we had a difference and, and it swayed the election. What do we do when it's really close? And the, cum the accumulation of all states and the totals could bring a very close matchup. Then what? Then do we have a 40 state recount? Or do we have only a 40 state recount of, of all election for those that participate in this process? Do we have all 50 states? Do we impose, uh, you know, does this affect the other states and their constitutional rights or their sovereignty? Those are the questions that haven't been answered by anybody. And to me, that's where it gets back to, we have 50 states. We have 50 states that can direct our electoral process and our elections. And to me, the greatest opportunity is to, is to really look at if we want true representation in our value of our vote, I kind of like the congressional idea. Um, truly a reflection of the people that reside in every state. Because they are very different, right? From our rural districts to our, our yep. metro districts. And everybody's vote would be equal, as close to being equal as you could get through this vast, great country we live in. So, Mr. Chair, I would love to see bipartisanship on this bill and the conversation if we're going to make significant change. I think it's really bad precedent that we would move this forward to the floor and take a vote on it. And for those reasons, I'll be voting no. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Coran. Um, and uh, I, we do have some time uh, for, for you to to offer your improvements to uh, Senator Hoffman, and perhaps there can be something that, uh, that he might yield to. Um, but at this point, uh, I think we're, uh, we don't have any other committees to go to and that, are, that have jurisdiction over this. Um, Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Hoffman and Senator Pearson for uh, taking your time to, to go through this with us. Um, I, one thing that you said, Senator Pearson, that kind of stuck with me um, that I, I'm going to just expound on a little bit is when I vote for governor, when I vote for my representative or my state senator, I think about those elections in terms of Minnesota. I think about voting as a Minnesotan. But when I vote for president, I don't think about my vote as a Minnesotan. I think about my vote as an American. And to me, that is 
the compelling thing that is in that election, it should be the total number of Americans who vote. Uh, the person who gets the most amount of those votes should win. And when we talk about belief in our democracy, belief in our election system, members up here are right. We are in a moment where people are losing faith in our election system. But part of that is our fault. Part of that is our fault as leaders because we talk about elections in a different way than we used to. We talk about them in a more partisan way. It's also a problem of the more than a billion dollars that you talked about, Senator Hoffman, that is spent on our elections and is spent to make us not trust the people that we are electing. Uh, when we hear 90% or more of the ads that are on TV for months going into an election say nothing positive about any of the people that we could be voting for, that sinks in. And people believe that none of us are up here to do good. We are all here to you know, tear our communities apart, or we would all be the worst candidate ever elected in our districts if you listen to what the other side says about any one of us. That doesn't give Minnesotans or Americans a lot of reason to trust the system because we've painted them a picture that politicians are not trustworthy. So there's a lot of reasons why there is lost faith in our democratic process. But I think at the end of the day, the very simple principle that we learn at a very young age that my elementary school kids know at the end of the day, the person who got more votes wins. That is the, the baseline of our system. And if we can talk to voters about that, that is a thing voters can understand, can appreciate, and can restore some of that faith. Uh, so, Senator Hoffman, thank you for bringing this bill. Uh, I look forward to continuing the discussion on the floor. Uh, I think it's important that we uh, move this conversation forward. Thank you, Senator Port. I can't say that, uh, uh, that I disagree with you at all. Uh, Senator Hoffman, do you have some responses on that? Mr. Chair and members, no, I just uh, thank you, uh, Senator Port. I mean, this is clearly the, the last 10 years this conversation has been exactly like this. And so uh, I would love to see this um, bill pass this committee and get moved to where it needs to go, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Uh, Senator Mitchell. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I too would just like to offer my support for this for a couple of reasons. Um, once I, one, I had the opportunity to in depth talk with Mr. Pearson and um, the logic and thought behind this and, and the clear path I was very impressed by. Um, I would also like to say, so having been in the military and, and traveled around the world, worked with a number of people, I have worked with people who in different capacities have helped with elections in different countries because sometimes they're not secure and sometimes our military members or ambassadors go in to help with those elections. Um, I think it hurts our credibility as a country in different locations when our popular vote is disregarded and while at the same time we're trying to tell other countries how they should be running their elections, um, sometimes disregarded by millions of votes. I would also like to say, just as an individual, that I have lived in some of these states where they clearly go one direction or another, and I think the perception is because I know some people just go to vote in the presidential elections. Um, when they know how that collective is gonna go, it gives them less incentive to vote. Whereas if they would be part of a bigger collective, then that one vote does matter. And finally, and it hasn't been brought up here, but we had an insurrection in our country two years ago. People can call it whatever it want, 
they want, but we had an insurrection. And in part of that, we saw, we suddenly were hearing terms like faithless electors. We had the senator from Wisconsin who um, was promising to give fake, fake electors and ended up under investigation. We had a whole bunch of things. So if we had something like this where it was very clear how our state's electors were going to go, I think it would minimize the chance of, of some of the, quite frankly, shenanigans that almost happened. Um, which I think most of us definitely would not ever like to see again in our country. So again, I offer my support of this and I appreciate your time here. Mr. Chair, if I may. Members. Uh, sorry, we're gonna stick with just members right now. Okay. We, um, Senator Marty, did you have uh... Mr. Chair, I was just gonna move the bill. We have one, one other person on the list here. That's uh, Senator Anderson. You had some questions. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Hoffman, I, I know that in talking with people in my district that uh, there are <laughs> Democrats who like the ranked choice voting. Mm -hmm. Do you prefer one over the other? I guess because you're bringing the national popular vote, do you have a preference because you're, you're representing the Democrat? Party from this vantage point, but I know there are other Democrats in my area who say, well, we like ranked choice voting, so how do you differentiate uh, in, within the, your own party? Senator Hoffman. Mr. Chair and, and members, and absolutely, uh, thank you, um, Senator Anderson. The, uh, they're both compatible. When you talk about that, when, you, when you're looking at it, ranked choice voting, fits. matter of fact, one of the uh, originators um, uh, ranked choice voting. We have some folks in, that are here from Fair Vote. Fair Vote, minutes, Fair Vote nationally um, supports the um, the uh, the compact, and so does our folks here uh, in Minnesota on ranked choice voting. And there was, if you look at, um, I had my notes on. On just give me one second to let me find this. Right here. Maine, so for example, uh, Senator, Maine was the only state which has used ranked choice voting in a presidential election, right? They passed an amendment that their ranked choice voting law, uh, which eliminated any potential uncertainty by requiring the final ranked choice voting tally to be transmitted as the final national vote count. So um, the National Popular Vote Compact intentionally leaves it to the states, uh, Senator Anderson, to decide how those votes are tabulated. So anticipating the adoption of systems like ranked choice voting on a state-by-state -state basis um, gets to that point where I say fair vote is absolutely a sponsor of the national popular vote. Mr. Chair. Follow-up? Follow-up, okay. thank you. Uh, so how do you integrate these two together that you're doing, we just talked about, ranked choice voting and, and the national popular vote? How do we bring them? To, uh, to me, they, it, it doesn't. They don't mesh. Mr. Chair and Senator Anderson, they, uh, Maine, Maine was able to do that, right? And um, ask me a question on integrating public law 94142 to 99457, and I could just bore you guys for the next five hours. In this case, um, when you look at what Maine was doing and you look at what Minnesota, Minnesota um, doesn't have the fair vote yet, right? I mean, there's a, there's a movement people want to have, as you had suggested, folks out in Drive right when you're in Wright County, right? Um, have, have said, have brought that to your attention. I think they are absolutely compatible, Senator Anderson. Hence, what Maine has done and what we will be doing forward here. Mr. Chair, follow up. Uh, I I don't agree with you, but we'll we're gonna let it go. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I'd just like to request a roll call. Senator, just a roll call on the final bill. Roll call requested. Roll call granted. Uh, and uh, what we have is uh, Senator Marty has moved Senate file 538 be recommended to pass and sent to the floor. And we have a roll call vote call. Senator Carlson. Aye. Senator Westland. Aye. Senator Coran. No. Senator Anderson. No. Senator Barr. No. Senator Bolden. Aye. Senator Swatzinski. Yes. 
Senator Dornick? No. Senator Limmer? Nope. Senator Marty? Aye. Senator Matthews? No. Senator Mitchell? Yes. Senator Ports? Yes. Senator Rest? Aye. There being eight ayes and six nays, the bill is passed and sent to the floor. Next thank, bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Next bill is Senate File 746, also uh, authored by Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. And you'll have an amendment. The uh, amendment is the A1 amendment. Uh, is it handed out, or do you have it in your packets? It, Senator Hoffman, it should be in the packets here, and uh, yes, it is. And Thank Senator Westland moves the adoption of the A1 amendment to get the bill in the form that the author desires. Everyone has looked at the amendment sufficiently. All in favor of the A1 author's amendment, say aye. aye. All opposed, nay. The the A1 amendment is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Chair Senator and members. Um, candidates of all levels of government have been reporting increasing threats and hostility um, while at campaigning, and it's hard to ignore the growing culture of political violence. Um, we know um, Secretary Simon uh, absolutely considered uh, moving his family into a hotel due to threats in 2020. And you look at 20, 2021, which focused on the COVID-19 restrictions, city council candidates and other local officials have also reported increased threats. Um, and, and those harassments have been skyrocketed since 2020. Matter of fact, we have a, 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 a senator right here in this chamber that actually increased the ability for you to be able to buy security systems with your campaign funds. I believe that senator is sitting right in front of me. And so, uh, the candidates, um, what we have here is this bill expands what we have as existing statute that allows candidates to request that their home address be classified as private data if they have reasonable fear for the safety of themselves or their family. Um, currently, candidates are allowed to do so if a police report or protection order has been issued, protection order as in the case that I experienced, with my family has been issued for their safety. Candidates would be required to explain their reasonable fear on the affidavit of candidacy and the candidate's address would still be included on the separate private form as the current practice. We have that current practice. Campaigns would also still be required to list a campaign contact address as well. Current law allowing a filing officer to review the private form to verify that a candidate's address is within their district is unchanged by this bill. If a candidate is found to be ineligible for office based on their address, the filing officer must still notify the candidate and remove their name on the ballot. Uh, this language applies to candidates at all levels. Candidates' addresses would still be accessible through the state voter registration system unless they take steps to have it removed by applying to their county auditor. It's unfortunate, Mr. Chair and members, that we're even having this conversation. It was unfortunate that we even had the conversation last year about the ability to buy security systems, right? Um, I want to encourage candidates from every background and every part of the state to consider running for office. Why not? I mean, that's what it's all about, just the debate we had in here earlier, and that should be going forward. But we should be able to have a reasonable standard of safety. And I know, Mr. Chair, our good old Rich Neumeister has, has got some concerns about standards, which is, that's his bailiwick. I'm going to let him talk about that. Um, but I really believe that a reasonable standard of safety is essential for us to accomplish that goal. And so um, with that, uh, Mr. Chair and members, you know, Rich, come educate us on on, uh, on what your standard is. Would that be okay, Mr. Chair? Senator, Hoff Senator Hoffman, yes, that would be fine. Uh, Mr. Rumi Neumeister, please uh, approach the microphone. Uh, be sure to, to write your name on the uh, testifier list and state your name for the record. Mr. And Chairman, continue. my name is Rich Neumeister. 
very quickly, a great discussion in the last two hours. I thought of Frank Felix Frankfurter's uh, dissent in Baker versus Carr. Senator Birch Bayes from Indiana's Don Quixote thing to try and abolish the uh, electoral college 50 plus years ago, and then 52, 53 years ago, it was a debate question for me. Should the electoral college be abolished? Anyways, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, I have a concern about the language. I think a reasonable fear, what is that? There, there is no, what is it? This law, which allowed candidates to do this, came in 2010. And it went through its metamorphosis where attached, because the legislature back then said, hey, if you're going to make the address private, there has to be some tangible aspect for the public to see why. That's why the police report was done. Secondly, that's why the order of protection was done, because both items are public. Here, it is not too clear to me what the voters, if, if a candidate is running for an office and they are choosing that they want to have their address as a candidate be private, and then that reasonable fear, that needs to be documented with, I think, on the same par as their police report or the order of protection. Now, the affidavit was discussed. This bill was done two years ago when we were all in our cocoons, you know, and we were all doing Zoom stuff. And I don't think uh, uh, Senator Pratt was the chief author of this bill. Uh, two years, in 2021, anyway. At least the name was on there. Okay. And, and then uh, it was, had a hearing in the House. Um, and there was some discussion, but it was only five minutes discussion. So the, the thing is, that's all I'm suggesting, is that there be some type of higher standard so the public can uh, get an idea of what it is rather than it just be there. Now, the affidavit, that's right, from the testimony I reviewed, the affidavit is public, except the private portion. So let's say, for example, there's a new little box that says, what's reason of fear? Well, because I'm getting threats, or this, or that. So the public can see that. That's my point. All I'm trying to do is get some public data out there, some kind of standard, mm -hmm. other than just reasonable fear. Again, yep. uh, there's not thousands of people here on this item, but I just look at that general principle. And as Jack Davies, who I think is a constituent of yours, former president of the Senate, was a longtime legislator here, he always says, the law is only as good as details that went into its creation, and also to make sure that good information becomes a good law. So I hope with some of the things that I've shared and others have talked about, we have some good law for at least for a little bit of sunshine and clarity as to why a candidate is choosing to be on par with those other two standards I was telling you about. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, that's my two cents. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. And. Uh, uh, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I love the, the invoke of Judge Davies. You know, uh, it's, it's Jack great. Davies. Judge Jack Davies. Judge Jack Davies. You know, the, the two things that, that do come up that I, I think are, are worthy of the conversation is when you talk about a standard for reasonable fear, that language allows the filing officer really to make that determination as to whether or not the attestation provided by the candidate is reasonable. You know, that's, um, um, you know, as a social worker, that's beyond my pay grade. And I think, you know, I, my, my assumption is we're going to move this to judiciary. Is that correct? Or is that, does the Warren Limmers and the uh, Ron Latzes of the world get to determine? Senator Hoffman, yes. That's the plan for it. All right. So I think that it's reasonable then to, to, to really have that reasonable conversation because the same standard that currently applies for existing statute when a, when a candidate applies for address privacy after any police report has been filed, right? But here's the thing I want us to really think about. This language will help individuals who can't get a police report but are still experiencing harassment or threats. I was physically assaulted in the Champlin City Hall um, bathrooms, right, by somebody, and um, absolutely. I mean, it's it's documented here, but but it's not documented 
um, you know, within the police. There was no police report that was written on it, right? Um, that's a different issue. Um, but I did bring it to the sergeants in, in the in the patrols, you know, efforts, and they said it had to become go back locally. But here's this individual who credible threats, and there's a certain senator on this bench who knows somebody that I know from the same town I'm from, who absolutely was worried about my safety, and um, and I, I I think of that and I go, wow. But there was no police report. But in my reasonable judgment and from people that I knew around the community, they actually had a concern on that, right? Now, this isn't about me, but it really getting to the point that Mr. Neumeister is bringing up, define reasonable fear. And I would hope that, you know, our Senator Latz can help do that. The other one, alternatively, that you talk about is um, working across, uh, and, and this is another one to throw to Senator Latz and Senator Limmer, is the standards for harassment, right? And, and that including that, that language in there too on the omnibus. If you're gonna do that, come back to put it in the omnibus bill. But you know, we do have a right to information about who is running to represent them, right? But those of us that have experienced and those that we know in the community have experienced and um, some things beyond reasonable or things around has harassment, again, I'm not an attorney. Uh, I played one once in a, in a school play, but I'm not one. But I think those those points are well taken, Senator Carlson, and I would really like to see this thing um, keep getting work on so we can get some safety in there. Make sense? Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Uh, Senator Rest. Questions? Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. I'm, um, I'm just trying to understand the uh, circumstances um, of how much information one would need to give a, um, that would be, re, you know, reflect a perceived fl um, fear, perhaps, um, not because of an incident, mm -hmm. but um, that was public, other people knew about it, that would give you the privacy of your, um, of your, of your address. And I'm um, uh, not looking through this as clearly as I might, but who gets to decide whether um, uh, your perceived fear um, uh, is real? So, so if I say, I mean, why don't we just let people say mm -hmm. that um, uh, I don't mind somebody verifying, obviously, that I live where I live, but what business it is, is it of anybody else's what my address is. I, I don't, why can't you just say, I don't want you to know? And who gets to decide that? And why is that, um, why is that judgment there? Um, I mean, I think most of us advertise where we live by all the signs we put in our yards, okay? But um, <laughs> why, why is that? Why, why can't you just say, um, I don't want my address known, and I don't want to tell you why. Anybody? Senator why can't Hoffman. You just do that. Um, um, I, uh, is this judiciary, maybe, uh, Mr. Senator, Chair? This is great. Madam, uh, Mr. Chairman, maybe um, uh, Senator Limmer has some. Um, but we, we have a list here that I, oh, okay. I should Any, respect. Anyway, that. that's my. That's my question of somebody who wants okay. to um, answer it. Why do I have to tell you why I, why do I have to even say I'm afraid? Why can't I just say, um, I don't want you to know? Uh, I mean, verify it, some officer of the court or whoever would be, um, an election judge, Senator Mitchell, somebody would know where you live. Um, and would attest to it, but then beyond that, um, Senator Westland, why is it any of your business? Okay, I'm, I'm going to jump here to Senator Limmer because he always or has Senator the Limmer, answers. Why is it any of your business where I live? Senator Limmer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Rest, I agree with you. Uh, and fix quite it. honestly, <laughs> to, uh, it might be a first, but uh, uh, I think the admission of fear could attract a perpetrator and encourage him. I don't think anyone needs to have a reason. And uh, I think by making that public admission, I think it could be a little more dangerous for a candidate. Mm -hmm. You know, when this, when this provision was originally created, 
um, for an option to play for a candidate when they're registered, when they're registering their campaign, uh, we didn't have that discussion of why. The question was, I just don't want my address to be known. Now, maybe they were fearful. Maybe they didn't want people buzzing their house. Maybe in my case, they didn't need five demonstrations on my sidewalk. But as for me, I made a choice not to hide my address. Heck, you can look up any internet <laughs> website and find my address. So, but, uh, but for that narrow purpose of, of hiding your address purposely, uh, I agree with you. I don't think it's anyone's business to know the reason. I just think that it's needed to uh, just to satisfy the concerns of that candidate. Mm -hmm. Nothing more. Mm -hmm. Senator Russ, follow up. <clears throat> yes, it, I don't. You know, I personally, I don't uh, object, um, and wouldn't think of keeping my address off. But I think also um, off the form. Um, um, because I want to be identified with my community specifically. That's my own preference. But um, I know that for voters, um, we have the safe at home um, provision so that if a voter, say, is, uh, doesn't want their address on the Secretary of State's website either um, because they're involved in a uh, custody dispute, and uh, the other party um, does not know where they where they live, and that's and maybe it's not a court order, but it's close. Um, and so uh, we're not going to discriminate against a, a person um, uh, from registering to vote and exercising their vote by publishing their. Um, their uh, their address. Um, it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit different. It seems to me because usually the courts are involved in that. But otherwise, um, you know, I'd never, you know, I hadn't really thought about it. But I'm just curious about. I'm just curious about it, Mr. Chairman. Think follow up, uh, Mr. Chairman. Senator um, Limmer. And of course, the difference between uh, issuing or having issued. A uh, harassment order, you do have to bring cause for, and then have a court make that decision. And then it does become a part of uh, a reasoned dis decision, and the concept of why is justified. Mm -hmm. uh, this isn't at that level, right. and yet it is uh, recognized. But, but nevertheless, this isn't quite that far, and I think it's just. I, I just think for some people it's common sense. If they want to do that, mm -hmm. fine, let them. Uh, the address or the location where you live in order to justify representing that district is going to be uh, checked on by the campaign finance. And if, any, if, if you're in the wrong place, believe me, your, your opponent will be more than happy to uh, <laughs> remind them. To tell people where you live, right? <laughs> Thank you, Senator Limerick. Senator, West, or Senator Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so I was going to say something else, so I'm going to pivot just for a second to answer all of this. Um, the only counter argument I can, I can think to this mm -hmm. particular issue is that um, as we've seen in some state level elections recently, occasionally there are situations where someone perhaps lives somewhere else and uses a community address mm -hmm. for their election address. And, um, but that's not really their primary address. And so I think by having community members able to access the address, they can say, you know what, that person, because campaign finance did not come check that I actually lived in the home I said I did. Everyone in my community knows where I live, but they didn't come check. Um, so that can be the only counter argument I can think of is that if the community, community members can see the address and say like, I only see that person there once every six months, then it's, then it's an additional check. Um, so that, that was just to that point. What I was going to say to this, 
um, is that I, I strongly support this. I actually called um, the Secretary of State's office when I had to file mine because I am a foster parent. And um, for one of my children in particular, I had a concern about my, even though people in my community who I trust, I don't have a problem knowing my address, there was, there was a, a parent um, who was not in a good situation and we weren't entirely sure it would be safe for them to know my address know. with the child. And so I called the Secretary of State and explained the situation and um, I got the answer that, well, do you have a police report? No, because this, this parent hasn't actually done anything yet. Well, do you have a, a restraining order? Same answer. Um, so my address got published and then I just had to hope that this person who is in a, a drug community didn't figure out how to access my address. Um, so I think there's a very legitimate reason to, to let people use their discretion to be able to do this. Um, so I am just um, stating my support for this. Thank you. Senator Krant. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and Senator Hoffman, so when I, when I look at it and our obligations of who we are, um, I think the Safe at Home, right, we've, we've talked about that, we love that program, but those are, those are people in dire situations who literally go, right, they move, they change everything, they don't, they don't frequent, right, their, their work, their <clears throat> travel, the, they go off the grid as much as they can, in fact, most of them, I think, move to distinctly different areas. We're talking about elected official. We all reside in a district, even if it's a fairly large district. Um, I'm not sure it's needed or that it provides any material value at all in true safety. And so does this just create some sense of false security? I, I don't know how any one of us here, Senator Rest mentioned it, we all put flags in our yard and, and, and banners and signs. Everybody in your community knows exactly where you live. And, it, and it's just not that difficult. I don't care who you are. If you occupy a public office, to obtain that information, you would, because what's available publicly, free is extremely detailed. Mm -hmm. What's available through subscription services is even more detailed than historical. And, and you would almost have to have a candidate go off the grid. And I don't know how you, how you serve a community in any size area or in, in jurisdiction in just Minnesota, a small state, even in a rural district, how you would be able to provide material value in this bill that actually provides some level of protection. It, to me, it, it, there's, it's just not possible. And so I then question, you said Senator Pratt brought up this idea, and I'd hate to question one of my own members, but um, an unnecessary uh, bill, because I just don't think we provide any security and material value. We did the security, we did security cameras and, and threats that we all receive for financial protection, our accounts, uh, you know, I've seen it when I was at the Department of Revenue, what people will file on your behalf to cause misery. Um, that happens in more targets. We, we do understand that, and we want everybody to be safe and secure. That's why we did the, the video and, and live monitoring so our residents are actually have some material security measures built into place to, to tr provide true protection. And we are all very aware, I think we're probably, anybody who's elected is heads on a swivel, it's the environment we live in right now. We all want it to, to the hostility to, to drop. But I don't think this bill actually provides any material value. I don't care whether you have a, a for cause, for reason, police report or not. At the end of the day, I think um, it, it would take minutes, even unless you move to safe at home, and even then, you would have to literally operate in an incognito manner and not be present in your, in your district and take the longest way home ever created by mankind to try and throw somebody off. So with that, I think it's an unnecessary bill and you can see I probably won't be supporting it. Thanks, Senator Hoffman. <laughs> Mr. Senator, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, only, only from the guy that, you know, from 
Alaska, you can see his house at Christmas time because there's so many lights. Everybody knows where Senator Curran lives, right? Because it's uh, the biggest Christmas uh, display in, in the uh, north of Anoka County. Um, would take us down a rabbit hole on that stuff. And, and, and I think um, the, the, the thing we want to get to is Senator Limmer and, and what Senator Rest were talking about is in, in, my, in the amendment that you all accepted, that language, um, it still clarifies when a candidate, the office that requests, right, the privacy piece on it, the filing officer must confirm within one day uh, of filing that the provided address that the filing officer knows uh, is within the district that candidate is running in. I mean, so there's still that, that piece that's in there. Um, yeah, absolutely, to Senator Coran's point, if somebody wants to get sophisticated on, on the Google stuff, but there's still that one little ledge, you know, of, of, um, of protection that could possibly be needed there. And then that's to the point, and what, what Senator Mitchell is saying, too. So I'm actually enjoying this debate. Is it going to go to, is it going to go to judiciary? Do they get to decide? Senator Hoffman will vote on it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Weston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would also like to speak in support of this bill, and <clears throat> I, have a, I have a sense that there's a possibility that some of the um, women elected officials may feel a little bit differently about this than some of our male colleagues. Um, uh, <laughs> women elected officials online and elsewhere are often targeted um, for very threatening comments. Um, they may be people who are not easily identifiable. Uh, and there are some of us who also may work in professions where we don't necessarily want to make it easy for people in our professional lives to be able to find our personal addresses. I can tell you, I do not give my, my legal clients my cell phone number. Um, I found family law clients have very bad boundaries, if nothing else. Um, and, and it's about carving out uh, um, safety not only for the elected official, but for their family. And I tend to agree with um, Senator Rest and Senator Limmer um, that, it, that it may go beyond just a safety question, and it's why do you need to know where I live? I, I am in the community. Um, I'm out in the community. If somebody probably wanted to find me, they could. But I also don't think we should necessarily make it super easy for people to do that. And for me as an elected official, if someone has an issue or wants to talk to me in some way, they can come to my place of employment here. And I think they shouldn't be coming and protesting to anyone's homes. I, I think that your, your family and your neighbors should have that, that bit of safety. And so, um, and I understand, Senator Coran, what you're saying, you know, whether you believe this will make a difference, I think that that's for the person um, making the decision to decide whether, whether they feel it makes a difference for them. And again, opinions may vary, mileage may vary on this particular uh, question. But again, I think we are in a very uh, toxic political environment for a lot of reasons. It would be great if we could all do our part to sort of lower the temperature. Um, but I, I fully support this bill. I think it's necessary. Uh, sometimes there aren't police reports filed, but there is, there are threatening statements or comments that may not rise to the level of um, the police doing anything other than I'm really sorry that that happened, but I can't do anything about it. That happens a lot. It happens a lot to women <laughs> seeking uh, orders for protection or other things. So um, I'm in support of this bill, and I encourage uh, members of this committee to vote for it. Thank you, Senator Westman. Uh, Senator Anderson. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Senator Hoffman, uh, this language you mentioned was uh, introduced uh, uh, previous sessions, uh, my understanding, and I was just wondering if you knew exactly where the language had come from, if it was from another state or from previous situations that you've encountered yourself, uh, or is there a specific language that you're copying from? Mr. Chair, Senator, Senator Hoffman. Anderson, thank you, a absolutely. So uh, you served in the other body, and that other body uh, took the language that they had been working on the last couple of years. They're the ones who got it green jacketed and yellow jacketed and sent it over. And then 
the conversations that we had with the Secretary of State's office, there was a, there was, in, and that's what you did on the amendment, on the A1 amendment, you, um, there was a, an issue of, uh, they had concerns about, you know, um, the affidavit of candidacy and whether or not you had to affirm it, right, and how you affirm it. I mean, they, they looked it over and made a technical change, and that's what you did with the A1 amendment. So started any other body of uh, the work that they had done the last few years. Um, uh, can I mention the representative, Jamie Becker Finn, who's a, a you know, a lawyer? So um, that's who that's where it originated from, and I believe she might have been on the one last year too. I'm not sure on that. I think so. So, yep. But Mr. Chair, it's a bit floating up. around. Senator Anderson. Well, I, I <clears throat> I'm kind of in the camp with Senator Rest and Senator Limmer, where uh, you know if your address is, needs to be known and you don't want to give it, why give it? Mm -hmm. Why? To, I mean, I I've gone back into the old green books and the red books and looking for people's addresses where Senator Rest used to live. Well, no, she's always lived there. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I do go back and look and see because things do change and it's interesting to see when all of a sudden the address that used to be in the 1996 book compared to 2012 is different. And so all of a sudden, They've decided that they don't want to give out that much information. I, I've often thought, I wonder when that, that individual legislator was born. And I can't find it in today's book, but if I go back far enough, I can find when they put down, yes. when they were naive like a freshman, <laughs> I put down my, well, I still put down my birth date. But I'm say, just saying that there's information you can leave out of some of these uh, requests from whoever is asking you. Yeah. And you know, you don't necessarily have to give that. And so I, I kind of agree with Senator Coran that, you know, this bill is, you can, we can already do this. We can already do all of this, and we can limit the amount of information that we give out as candidates as long as it doesn't hinder us from being a candidate running for office. And that would come from the Campaign Finance Board or from the Secretary of State's office if there are things there that we ha ha haven't divulged to the public or they say you have to give that kind of information. So I'm, I'm kind of just torn like saying, uh, I think we can do it all right now. Mr. Chair. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, thank you, Senator Anderson. Absolutely, and there's still, I think, I, I still think there's a gap, and, and, and this is why, you know, you, when Senator Rest and Senator Limmer were talking about the why, right? The, there's still, there seems to be a gap on, you know, if I feel I'm in reasonable fear, right? You might not feel you're in reasonable fear. Um, uh, that's my definition. That's my, I mean, how, how, you know, getting to where Rich Neumeister's talking about different standards on it, right? I, I think it, there's, there's a compelling discussion that needs to happen. What is reasonable fear? And what, what about harassment? You know, I absolutely, and, and Senator Cran, you know who I'm talking about, the individual that we both know in the certain city I'm from, who called me after that incident occurred at City Hall and was absolutely saying, you know, I should fear, right, for what, what this person could possibly do to me, right? That, I sat back and I just kind of went, huh, you know, but you don't believe in, in when, you know, in my 20s I ran a juvenile detention facility. I know where my proxemics are. I know where I'm at in every, every room, right? Because once you get attacked by somebody and you're sent to the ER room, you don't, you don't, you don't make that same mistake twice, right? I tell you this, outside my door, I'm looking around. All of, a sudden, all of a sudden, I heightened my awareness, Senator Anderson. And so for me, um, I had reasonable fear, right? And uh, that was my definition of it, yet you probably wouldn't have the same or somebody else wouldn't have the same definition. But to me, so I don't know how you define that, you know, if you define that in statute or if you put it in there. And if we can already do it, then why did Senator Mitchell experience what she experienced when she called the Secretary of State's office and said, you know, did you have a police report? Did you have this? So there's got to be some kind of fix in there. And I think, you know, you're the right people right here sitting at the table to fix that fix. So it's just my opinion. So I appreciate your comments. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Hoffman, thank you for bringing this bill. Uh, like Senator Westland, I think there are probably differences on how we perceive the need for a bill like this. Um, 
there are there was a study done by the Princeton Bridging Divides uh, over the last two years that uh, tracked 100,000 different political threats uh, that were made in this country or threats, threats and harassment that were made against politicians in this country. And 42% of them were directed against women, uh, which based on the amount of elected women we have, mean women are three and a half times more likely to receive threats and harassment than our male counterparts. Um, so this is a thing that we live with, um, and 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 I think like that is that matters, right? Um, because uh, to Senator Limmer and Senator Rest Point, um, should we have to? Like, should should that have to be a requirement? Should we we have to sign up for that? Um, I worked uh, on the camp on campaigns this year. I uh, worked doing some recruiting for campaigns. And every single female candidate or potential candidate that I spoke to, every single one of them asked about the harassment and the threats that they could expect to get as a candidate or an elected. That's a problem. Lots of them signed up to run anyway because we care about this work. And we care about our communities and we want to do it. But should we have to be subjected to that level of harassment and threat? Um, Senator Hoffman, I do ask moving forward if you would consider removing the reasonable fear. Uh, because I do think, um, you know, what does that mean? And should we have to be afraid before we can remove that? Um, every single woman I know who signed up to run knew this was coming. They didn't know when. They didn't know when they would get their first harassment, when they would get online trolls, when they would get people sending things to their houses. But they knew it was coming. And so I, my question, you know, my ask of you as this moves forward we, would be to consider removing that reasonable fear point. If you don't want to put your address out there publicly, we are in a climate now where you should not have to. Uh, I think that that is, it's very clear and I, I appreciate very much the step to take it back from needing a police report because that's a very high standard uh, that, you know, I had things mailed to my house during the last election cycle with vulgar comments and uh, you know really inappropriate things. And the police were like, "Sorry, that's awful. There's nothing we can do about it." Um, I, I wouldn't have had the le I didn't have the level of justification that was required at this point. So I appreciate you stepping back from that, but I, I would ask that you consider stepping back even further to, to not require um, that level of fear before we can take this step. Yeah, Mr. Chair, and, and, and thank you, Senator Port. You, you're getting right into the conversation of the why that Senator Rest and Senator Limmer were, were doing, you know, why, why? I mean, I, I guess, absolutely. I think at the end of the day, you know, we all want to feel like we're safe in our, you know, our house is our is our castle, so to speak. So yeah, a a absolutely, you gotta you gotta have that conversation. I actually would look for the debate if this would go to judiciary. It'd be fun to see Senator Limmer. And are you on judiciary, Senator Rest? Mr. Chair, may I ask Senator Rest a question? Feel free, Senator Hoffman. No, is did Senator has Senator. Uh, uh, have you gotten a communication from Senator Lass, Lats asking for this bill? Has your no. LA or your CA received a notice for a re referral to judiciary? I mean, we can send it there anyway, oh. but I was just wondering if they had looked the bill over. Senator Rest, no. no. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, Senator Marty, but first. I want to, I'm just holding back quite a bit here. Uh, one of the things I want to say is that I've been here a while now, and uh, I'm in my 15th year. And in my first term, uh, I experienced feedback from constituents. One of them said that he's saving his last bullet to go between my eyes. And I didn't think that was serious. And I, 
I just kind of pshawed it. And, and then uh, I have a friend who was an Egan police officer, and she said, you have to send that in to us. And you know, I find after she harassed me more, I did finally send it in. But uh, through other experiences, I've gotten to know, I, I knew Susan Carlson's uh, um, security person, uh, um, Arnie Carlson, security person, uh, and in fact, Jesse Ventura's security person used to be uh, one of the, the uh, um, deputy sergeants at arms here. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've heard from the LATS campaign, all of them talked about the number of death threats they get. It's absolutely stunning how many death threats they get. A friend of mine was on the, the Supreme Court. He got death threats. He had the state patrol parked outside of his house sometimes for weeks because they had death, death threats. Now, I don't get that kind of death threat, but uh, I have to say, Senator Cran, uh, when you brought that bill to me, I had already bought cameras for my house. And so I was a co-sponsor on that bill, yes. And, uh, um, and since then, I've, I felt very good about that, although it was purchased uh, too early to take it off on, on my uh, uh, non-campaign expenses. But uh, I was concerned at that time because, and what a lot of people don't know, is we had an FBI report here that identified a group that was setting up to do something uh, on the Capitol Mall, and they had actually, the, whoever it was, if it was the FBI or, or whomever, had intercepted emails saying that they were going to set up sniper locations on the buildings here. And if some of us remember, the uh, public safety commissioner called the police chiefs in our districts and said, I want you to assign somebody to watch your candidate, your, not candidate, but your legislator. And so I had a police officer assigned to me. And, uh, and they came out to my house and looked over uh, what kinds of things, what kind of additional things I might need. And I have a sister, I have two sisters that lived uh, about 500 feet away from me. And they're both with, uh, they're both single. One of them, is uh, never married, and she, her Carlson is her last name, and everybody thinks she's my wife because I've had plenty of events over at her house. And so I told the police, you have to watch her house as well. You have to drive by her house. You have to make sure. But those are the kinds of things that we never hear about in public, how often we're getting threats and getting the kinds of things that, you know, we can, you know, we can laugh them off. But after a while, you start to think, Gee, you know the guy in uh, where is it, New Mexico? Yep. Who hired people to go shoot at uh, other other elected people? You know, this is the the ramp that we're on. We're on something that's getting worse, and I'm not exactly sure how to deal with it. Um, you know, we could probably all use a, a mail drop, you know, a UPS box or something like that for our address. But you know, then I think about what you were saying is that, you know, really. Why should we bother giving them any information? You know, I know they know where my office is. They can leave messages on that phone. They can come here and talk to us. You know, there there are op other ways to get a hold of us. And I think uh, if anybody Google's as much as I do, you, all you need to do is put somebody's name in, and you'll find you'll find all the Jim Carlsons in the state. One of them is in is in prison for eight years, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of, of threatening that we're getting. And so I have to say that I'm sympathetic to the people that may not want to use the word scared, but they are concerned. And I think that the, the males, you know, we don't get the same kind of threats as the females do, but we have gotten many threats. And I think uh, one of them that I can say happened in my second term which was right after the Boston Marathon bombing, where we got a threat that you're next. I, we know where your office is, you're next. And at that time, my legislative assistant was this young woman that I've known forever. I know her parents. I've known her since she was a child. And I wasn't in the office. And I was scared to death 
that somebody was going to come in, open up the door where she was located, and start blasting. And you know, then I find out that it was uh, it was intercepted, and more senators than just me got it. But there there are times when you do get scared. Yeah. You you are concerned, and waiting until after the fact to file a police report just doesn't do anybody any good. So with that, Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think Senator Hoffman has a good bill. And um, in regards to Senator Coran's, this may not solve everybody's problems. But nevertheless, I think when Senator Mitchell expresses concern for the sake of a family member or Senator Westland because of legal related things, um, I think the whole point is this does make a little more protection for people. There's no reason not to do this. Yes, we, somebody has to check to make sure you're legitimately representing that community, that you legitimately live there, which we don't really do a lot of that now. But um, I think that the amendment Senator Hoffman put on is a reasonable one. But with that, I, I guess I just, um, I'll move the bill. I, I think we ought to vote on it if you don't like the bill, Mr. vote Chair, against it. One quick question before you move well, on. We've got Senator Barr, and I'll, I'll go to you next. Senator Barr. You, you are done, Senator Marty? Yeah, just moving the bill. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I had a different question than the discussion at hand on your amendment. It says that uh, one business day from receiving the filing determine whether the address provided in the affidavit of candidacy is within the represented mm -hmm. by the office of the candidate is seeking. Just says the address. It doesn't say you're actually checking that that person's there, which kind of goes to what Senator Marty just mentioned. Um, do, is this actually, it's not, the address you put on the affidavit is in the district. That's easy enough to determine. You don't have to, leave the office, but to verify they actually live there, um, it wasn't that long ago that we had a legislator with a Wisconsin driver's license, probably didn't live in the district. Um, we have this issue every time we do redistricting, check to see if you're in your district. Mm -hmm. So I was just kind of curious about why you chose to just verify the address presented was in the district as opposed to actually verifying that the person is in the district, filing the app, is physically in the district. Mr. Chair. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator. Uh, remember, you, you're, you're filing for a Senate district, that area you represent. They're, they're verifying whether or not you live in that Senate district. Hence, you look at the argument just northeast of you, there was a certain House member that there was a, they had to verify the the, the district, right? It wasn't the, and, and it was that house where that person lived was outside of the, in the, in the language was outside of the district. And, and the other person that you referred to about the Wisconsin thing, it is my understanding that person actually maybe could have filed that their address not be um, known in, in the Secretary of State. That's just, you know, firehouse rumor, but that's, you know, but to that point, it, it really gets to the area that you represent is your Senate district in our case or the Senate district A or B. That's that's what it, it's consistent. Senator Cram. Oh, Jeff oh just follow up real quick. Thank you. So um, I, maybe we don't, I should talk offline about changing that so we actually verify that our candidates, legislators actually live in their district. I mean, that probably doesn't be part of this bill, but you and I should talk about that offline and maybe make sure we actually live where we represent? Uh, Mr. Chair and, and Senator, Senator Barr, Hoffman. absolutely. We'll get the clarification from the Secretary of State's office. This is consistent with their current thing, but yeah, let's absolutely get the clarification from them. Agreed. Thank you. Senator Hoffman. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm keeping that Senator, one. Senator, Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, no, no, they no, no, normally no. call me uh, yeah. Senator Jasinski or Utke, so we're good. We answer All three of us answer by either <laughs> or any of the, the above. Um, Senator Hoffman, um, in, along with, you know, I, I, I always take a pragmatic look and, and a realist, and so will this provide the protection and also then hide your address on your statewide voter registration record? And if so, how would different addresses be reconciled from a voter rec records perspective? Mr. Chair. And Senator Hoffman. Senator Coran, no, if you look at that, the language applies to the candidates at all levels, right? The candidate's address would still be accessible through the, the SVRS unless taken steps to have it removed by applying to the county auditor. So there's another step in that, Senator Coran. You want to change that? Thank, 
I'm just Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Hoffman, Senator Hoffman. I'm just trying to make your bill feel better with real protection. So I'm glad there's an element there. But okay. again, there's just so many of those vehicles that you would have to exercise to get to remove from a public records perspective that I, I think it feels good and the intent, we all agree with every every intent listed here. I'm just not sure it provides any practical um, value. And, and coming from somebody who's received thousands and thousands of threats, um, and yes, 4,000 people you drive to my front yard as well. Um, I do take them very seriously, but I just don't know that this gets us here. So I appreciate the, the piece on the voter rec registration file. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Hoffman. Thank you. Comments? Any? Oh, Senator Limmer. And by the way, Senator Limmer is on the Judiciary Committee. Really? So we can, uh, <laughs> and so is Senator Westland. So we, you know, we can pin the rose on him for me making maybe some uh, <laughs> corrections on this. <laughs> well, speaking of corrections, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, uh, in order to uh, perhaps placate Senator Barr's concern, uh, could I bring our attention to the A1 amendment? Uh, and I'm just going to softly suggest some language and see where the uh, committee might consider. Um, after the first the in, in line 1.5, where it starts out, determine whether the, uh, insert the words candidate's residential address. Would that satisfy Senator Barr's concern for clarity? And Senator Hoffman, is that something that would help? Mr. Chair. Senator Hoffman. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Limmer. Yeah, I, I think it satisfies Senator Barr's curiosity, but the, one of the things he and I were going to do was to get clarification from um, Secretary of State if that is indeed part of that. So I, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm germane either way. I mean, if you want to, if you wanted to put that in there and then it's something, I, I guess if you're just going to lay it over, you can, you can fix it all along the way. I mean, I really but depends Hoffman, on I'm, I'm going to call up uh, Nicole Freeman from the Secretary of State's office. Maybe ah. Maybe. Yeah. She was hiding over there. You were hiding. <laughs> hiding in plain sight. In plain sight. Where you been? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. You're good. Uh. Hi, Ms. Hoffman. Uh, or, yeah, <laughs> Hoffman. Everybody's Hoffman today. Uh, yeah, Ms. Freeman, can you please uh, you, just kind of go over some of the members. questions we've had here? Um, I think the uh, I think the um, the amendment um, would clarify. Oh, identify uh, yourself for the record. Please. Oh, apologies, uh, Nicole Freeman, Office of Secretary of State, Government Relations. Um, the amendment um, from Senator Limmer would clarify um, that the. Uh, address that the filing officer would be um, determining if it, the address itself is within the district um, that they're running for. Uh, that would clarify that it's the residential address they're checking as they, there's also a line on there if you have a campaign address that you want, you know, members of the public to mail you things. Um, you can put a campaign address on that, on that uh, affidavit of candidacy. Um, however, to Senator Barr's point um, or question, uh, filing officers, um, you know, anyone from a school district clerk um, all the way up to the office of the Secretary of State, we don't have investigative power. And so, um, you know, we, we've seen previous, uh, you know, sort of the steps that the court has taken to determine residency um, and do that investigation, but uh, currently under statute, um, filing officers don't have that that um, the ability to, you know, determine someone lives in the physical house, right? Um, and like clear and do that, uh, but they do have the uh, the the uh, ability um, and resources to determine if the address that someone is putting on their affidavit of candidacy, which is a legal document, so if they're uh, if they do lie on it, you know, they're perjuring themselves. Um, they are able to determine whether or not it's within a certain 
um, you know, geographic uh, district. I don't know if that was helpful, but I hope it was. Any, any further questions? Senator Barr, follow up. Uh, not really a further question, but Senator Hoffman, you and I will still need to talk because it's not doing what I want it to do. It's you're just verifying the, that this is a the address listed is physically on paper in the district, not that actually somebody resides there. So you and I will talk offline. Thank you. Thank you, and Mr. Chair. The, the issue Hoffman. there, the the filers don't have investigative authority, which is that's an interesting. That's a legal term, right? Uh, you know, do you know anybody that sits on judiciary that might want to take that up, Mr. Chair? <laughs> <laughs> and I guess just to clarify, uh, Ms. Freeman, you too. Uh, the Secretary of State's office does not investigate whether the person is in the district that they filed in. Uh, am I correct in that, that that's not a function that you do? Chair Carlson, that's correct. What we, what, uh, for, um, if a, if um, someone requests that we ver currently under statute, um, if we currently under statute, if a voter requests that the office um, or any filing officer verify someone who has kept their address private, um, someone can make a request that the office, the filing officer, verify that the address is within the district. Um, right now, it's at the request um, that that happens. So the OSS uh, will uh, look at the address and look at the district or boundaries and determine whether or not it's within the address is within um, the boundaries. Thank you, Ms. Freeman. Um, for now, uh, Senator Marty renews his, his motion to uh, uh, adopt the A1 amendment. We've already adopted the A1 amendment, but to, to move uh, to pass the uh, uh, 746 as amended and move it to Judiciary, oh. the Committee on Judiciary. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no? No. no. Okay. <laughs> the ayes have it, and the bill is moved. Th thank you, Mr. Chair and members, and Senator Rest was right. Thank you. Uh. <laughs> okay. You have to adjourn us. Mm -hmm. That was oh, I'm sorry. Oh, my God. With, no more, <laughs> with no more business, the meeting is adjourned. Just looking over at you. Where are you? Oh, good. Yeah. Um. Yeah.